Hello and welcome to this episode of Wi-Fi Friends. My name is Cameron Morris and I'm joined by... John Johnson. That felt weird. I messed it up. I, I made you introduce yourself. How could I? I was like, oh, I don't say my name very often. No, I, I mean, I say my name too much, I think. I think after... Oh so many years of being in a channel where we constantly introduced ourselves i'm, I'm like so used to saying hello i'm Cameron Moore. it doesn't even mean anything anymore to me it's just yeah. like a thing. i think you just watched and read too much scott pilgrim and so <laughs> you're one of those guys who for the longest time was like i'm gonna call my friends by their full names <laughs> i do that for certain friends i definitely have steven stills in my life yeah <laughs> you know and it's like hey is steven there Wh- who's steven you know St- steven do you mean Stephen Stills? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, John, how, how how have you been these these past couple of days? It's been actually, uh, we've actually done this on a weekly basis for once. <laughs> it's been weird. A lot has changed in a week. Mm-hmm. Really? You know, I woke up, I heard a rapping on my window seal. What? A rapping. Ooh. You know, a rapping noise, and I woke from a sleep, and there death was waiting outside my window oh no (laughs) death came for me cameron morris oh goodness death came for me and i looked death in its barren cold eyes and i said not today death not today (laughs) how how what form did death take friend a lot of a lot of uh, just just Throwing up and, you know, yeah, using the bathroom, man. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't tell whether to be incredibly vulgar or incredibly I prude. <laughs> I had this moment where I was just like, do I do I go full one end of the spectrum? So I, I settled for a weird middle ground. That's fair. That's fair. You were like, I just was shh, using the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've been ill, I, I assume. I had a good. I'm not sure if it was food poisoning, or just a, a 24-hour stomach flu, or I don't know. But uh, now I'm feeling a little bit better, able to move around, and able to eat without going to the bathroom constantly. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, it was touch and go there for a while, man. You know, it's strange, friend. It's very strange when you um when you get ill because you kind of turn into probably the closest thing to like a real life zombie. I've been watching Jen yeah. recently. She's she's been really ill, and she's been going through this um kind of phase where she like gets up and she goes like, <laughs> and she like will walk over to the like sofa and she'll lay in the sofa and she'll wrap herself in blankets for ten minutes and then she'll become incredibly warm and then she'll throw them off and then incredibly cold and it, it's just like it just it's weird because. I remember being ill, but you can never really remember what it's like until you're there in it, being like, oh my god, I will always appreciate being not ill. <laughs> my favorite thing about, like, sicknesses and stuff is, like, so when I worked at Disney, um, like, after New Year's, I remember this very vividly. I got a upper respiratory infection Oof. and an ear infection at the same time. Yuck. I still went to work. Oh my but goodness. then there... There are days where I have like the slightest of head colds yeah. and I can't do a thing. And I'm just in bed like, oh, no, what the world? No, I can't. It's too much. Please give me some water. <laughs> See, I, I think it's weird with me. I, I need other people's permission. But as soon as I have it, I'm like, okay, I need to leave. Like, like I can be really, really ill. And like, still would be like in my head, be like, okay, I gotta go to work. But then, as soon as someone goes, "Hey, are you sure you should go to work?" My mind completely is like it justifies everything, and then I'm like, "No, I'm not yeah. going to work." <laughs> like, you're I like, need... "Oh no, I shouldn't. I should never go to work again." I... <laughs> I need some outside source to like tell me I can't do it myself. But then I'm not. I can never like. Te- I can never like say no. Like I can never be like. Yeah. No, no, I should go to work. Like as soon as someone else goes, "Hey, you don't look so good," I'm like, "Yeah, I'm dying." <laughs> my favorite thing is like when you're when you're sick at work um it would just become like this performative art piece for me really you know it's just like i'm just the most like because i'm just the sickest person in the world and my like manager or my leaders would come to me like john you should go home you're sick and i'm like no i can do it <laughs> i'm like a soldier i remember i would um if i was sick like 
I did. I never wanted to be the one that was like, "I'm too sick. I gotta go home." I would always like, you know, hope that they would send me home. Because in that in that <laughs> regard, I would be like, "Okay, well, they can't blame me now. They have to like, yeah, because it's them who sent me home." So I remember one time I was feeling sick, and I was like genuinely really sick, but I didn't want to. I I think that I'd taken some time off just before, and I just come back, so I felt like I didn't want to go up and be like, "Oh, I I want to go home," but I really didn't want to stay in work. So what I would do is I would walk around the building. And the bits where I knew the cameras were, yeah. as soon as I hit one of those pockets where there's a camera on me, I would just cough. I mean, no one around me. There was no one there. And I would just <laughs> cough in the middle of, like, a hallway where I knew there was a camera and pray that they were watching. And I would do it for every camera I would come across. <laughs> but I'd be walking fine down the hall, down the hall. And then I would open a door to a room where I knew there was a camera. And I would be, like, limping in. I'd be like, oh. Yeah, you just <laughs> open the door and just, like, Oh, like your hand goes to your forehead and you pass out. <laughs> or even I just like flop into the room. I just fall. <laughs> and then I just stay on the ground for like 40 minutes and hope that someone looks at it. You just walk in bleeding from the side. <laughs> and then they're like, hey, Cam, you okay? I'm like, I'm fine. No, I'm cool. I'm fine. I'm all right. Oh, no, I'm right. no, I'm fine. Did you, what, did you see something? <laughs> yeah. Did you see something that maybe made you think otherwise? <laughs> No, but it's 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 interesting. It's a it's it's never fun to be ill, but there's definitely certain times where it's worse to be ill. Like yeah, like the, you can be in like a good mood and be ill, and you're like, ah, oh, you know, oh, shit, I'm ill, but like I'll get through it. But if you're like not having a good time and then you get ill, it's just almost like one other thing, you know. And it's just like, yeah. oh, this is just a, it feels like because I feel like as humans, when we're having a bad time and something bad happens during that bad time we almost like in our heads create this narrative that it's like oh someone's punishing me oh this is this is yeah and then you get sick and you're just like oh oh now (laughs) now i can't eat anything i see how it is you like forget all the times that you were sick and like that and it wasn't like integral or important you just really remember the times that you were sick and it was the worst thing ever (laughs) yeah um that sucks, man. But I'm glad you're feeling a bit better. I am glad that you were. Uh, you sound well enough to do a pod. Because I, I remember you said yesterday that you were sick, and I was just like, "Oh man, I hope it doesn't last like a week." Like, because Jen's has been going for a long, long time. John John sick stares death in the face and says, <laughs> "Not today." You're really trying to get that as a piece of artwork, aren't you? Like, you I, know, I'm just trying to like get this narrative across. I'm like this lone gunslinger, you know. I never want that to be the narrative about me, though, because then that means that people think that I'm capable and they'll ask me to do things. I want the narrative yeah. of Cameron Morris to be that if, like, a, a single germ lands on my <laughs> finger, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> like, my version of your story is I saw death come to my window and he was knocking on the window and I thrust open the window and dived into his arms. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> recently... I have been. I wanted to talk about um, this a little bit, a little tiny bit, because it's been uh, on my mind. So I had a a, a message um, via the the rotoscope uh, uh, chat that we all have. For those who don't know, I'm part of a a kind of umbrella thing called Rotoscope Media. We do channels like uh, Commit to the Bit, which is kind of more my thing. There's also channels like um, Arcade Academy, Arcade which is less Academy. my thing. I do voice for it, but it's 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 very much not my channel. And then there's also like other things, like like recently, um, Rotoscope has launched a like a kind of web comic thing called uh, Duddles, and that's really fun. And you can go. I don't that. get the references, but they're funny. I don't either. I have nothing to do with them. I mean, I'm part of Rotoscope, so I I do see them and I get feedback on them and stuff. But um, but I have nothing to do with them. Uh, they're very much like video game oriented and, and not video games that I play. So that's cool. Uh, but I, I still find them funny. Um, but another thing that we have recently launched and that was a, a message was sent to me is like any members of the Rotoscope Media um, kind of group uh, who want to start a blog. And the blog would be on the Patreon. The way it works is you would put the blog up and the patrons would be able to read it. And then later on, uh, somewhere down the line... The normies would released. get to read it. Yeah, exactly. But they would still be... On the Patreon, the Rotoscope Media Patreon, if you can, can't tell, I'm plugging right now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so, so, you know, even... man, you chose the right platform to plug. <laughs> you know. Even if you, um, even if you 
we're into Patreon. You can still go to the Patreon and read them there, and it, it, it would be kind of like it's the kind of like the scummy thing of like, hey, you're already here. You're reading the blog. You may as well, you know. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so I started blogging, and now blogging is something I'm not familiar with. I obviously know a lot about it. I I used to read blogs back when it was like I don't know. 2009 2010 you know when blogs were kind of like wordpress.com <laughs> man exactly yeah yeah and and jen had a blog and a couple other people had a blog and i've also respected blogs in the sense that they were the forefathers forefathers of the vlog you know and a vlog is yeah. something i'm very familiar with so I, I think it's just kind of like it's a more to me it's a more prestigious version of vlogging you know it's it's like how how a lot of filmmakers see see uh, people who write novels where it's like you know i make films but you make novels like wow yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um i make a cw show you make an hbo show <laughs> exactly. your prestige <laughs> blogging so i i was kind of hesitant but i figured you know what i give it a go the only people who are going to be reading it are you know initially people who are already fans of of me in some capacity so i thought you know what the hell i'll give it a go so I wrote a blog post, um, and then I, I've written a second one, but I, have, I haven't put it up yet. Um, and it's been a weird experience. I, I, I know you, you're more um, experienced with writing, you know, uh, per se, than me. But it's not something that I'm very super comfortable with. Even when I write stuff like scripts and f- and film scripts and comedy scripts, I usually do it in a collaborative sense. So there'll be someone else in the room, and I'll be bouncing ideas off them and, and kind of like chatting chatting about it as i'm writing it or or like if i am writing it by myself i'll constantly be like sending it like i'll write a paragraph yeah. and, and send i'll write like a scene and i'll send it to you know people who like you know make films with me and i'll be like what do you guys think of this so it's always been a collaborative thing with me this is my first time where i'm actually just writing something by myself and then never showing it to anyone and just putting it up straight away and it's very daunting it's very um i don't know i i, I have done i, do, I realized that I have insecurities that didn't exist, which is never a fun experience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I kind of was like, well, fuck it. I'll just write about that. So the first <laughs> blog is actually just about that. It's it's kind of like one of the most annoying things ever where you write a blog about writing blogs. But <laughs> I figured, you know, it was on my mind. And and it's kind of yeah. been, um, it's been weird. And I wanted to ask you, this isn't really the topic, but it's just like, you know, part of my intro bit. Uh, have you ever thought of writing a blog or have you ever written a blog before and what has you been experiencing? I have thought about it a lot. I have like always like, I think I go through these phases of like, oh yeah, a blog would be great. Or just writing like, um, what opinion pieces, Mm. like stuff like that of like articles of like, oh, this is how I feel about whatever this thing, whatever. But like my main thing, I guess, is I'm always like afraid of getting too personal with stuff like that. I see. Um, which makes a lot of sense in the grand scheme of my life, honestly, when you think about it. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, do you think that, because did you find that this experience was a little bit easier for you than writing, um, like the scripts and stuff? Uh, it was, I think, I don't know if it was the the blog format or the thing I was writing about. But it, it, it yeah. felt easier to write, kind of funny in, in, in juxtaposition to what you just said. It felt easier that I was writing about such personal things um, yeah. in such a non-abstract way. So, for example, the recent uh, film, uh, say recent, I made it a year ago, but the film that I recently put out on Wi-Fi Friends, when I wrote that, it took two years to finalize the script. I was writing and writing and writing and writing. Again, I wrote that with other people, but it was tough for me because I was writing about something that was very, very personal and a lot of issues that were very relevant to my life at the time. Um, But I was writing them in an abstract way because it was fictional, even though it was real things. It was a fictional, it was fictional characters in a fictional version of a real place where I really grew up, you know? So it's yeah. like, it's this weird dichotomy. And that was tough for me because I wanted so bad to get it right and for, for to get it, to make it accurate. Whereas writing the blog was easier for me because it was so just true and honest yeah. that I never had to be like, well, how do I convert my feelings into... A plot it was just yeah. cut that out and it was just like here are my feelings however that's the thing is 
sorry, I was just going to say, however, the disadvantage of that was I didn't think that it ended up being anywhere as interesting. Because for me, it's interesting when you make a film because it's like, how do I take my feelings and make them into a way that other people can put their own feelings on top of it? Whereas in a yeah. blog, it's just kind of like, hey, here's me. <laughs> yeah, I was just say there's a difference. Like, because they always say, you know, like, everyone has their own voice when they're writing. And, you know, like, you can see that in, in fiction and stuff like that. But they don't talk about how hard it is to lose that voice when you're writing, like, fiction and stuff like that. Because a lot of times, I don't know, you have perceptions of what what a novel is, what is a story, what is a script, whatever. Mm. And sometimes you fall, you fall into, like, things that you're like, oh, well, I need to be super descriptive here and talk about all this stuff because that's like what i don't know jared tolkien did or whatever like yeah. whoever i read um and you kind of lose like you, that voice that like part of you while yeah. like when it's more personal it's it is literally your voice and so sometimes that's easier because it's just more like you know honest it is and it's it's for me it's easier i'm not saying it's easier for everyone i i, I also know that like it's probably harder to do if you know, you don't like talking about yourself, but I don't mind talking about myself. I do it a lot in real life. Um, so that's probably easy for me. But it does, like I said, and like you just mentioned, it's harder to um, to reel back that sometimes. But it is also for the good. Because sometimes if you reel back that, like, you know, uh, just i'm just being me like it is good like like edgar wright quentin tarantino like these big directors they do have a voice but their films yeah. aren't just them sitting in front of a camera talking about themselves you know this they, yeah they, they they have a very uh a very personal style um but they manage to turn that into something that other people can imprint on and that's something that i don't think i could do with a blog so i'm not even attempting it what i'm just basically doing is seeing if i can write about my life or write about observations that I make and make it fun and interesting and, and mostly funny. Like that's kind of what I'm going for. It's like funny yeah. with a bit of a heart, you know, um, we'll see how it goes. The The second post I've written is a bit more comedic than the first. The first got a little bit deep, a little bit fast. It was like an episode of Wi-Fi friends. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, I went into it being like, this will be fun. And then by the end, I was like admitting to things that I didn't even know about myself. <laughs> I was like, yeah. this is the first we, post. That's another tagline for Wi-Fi friends. We get deep <laughs> fast. I don't know if we want to tag that. <laughs> we might show up on some sites. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. You know, was... man, just advertising. You got <laughs> to know where the people are. But yeah, right now, um, right now, Jess and I are the only ones doing... Um, uh, blog posts but hopefully we can get the other the rest of the team in and maybe even if i can convince him uh john might even do some blog posts in the future oh lord we, we'll see how it goes we'll see we'll see how how personal he wants to get or how impersonal <laughs> i mean you know i i was just begging i just was begging to make dumb content for you guys for the longest time <laughs> you know, it's whatever <laughs> We'll see how it goes. But yeah, it's just interesting. For the longest time, Rotoscope is just a YouTube channel. Uh, well, not a YouTube channel, but a, a facilitator for YouTube channels. And now I feel like it's turning into something uh, fun and interesting and even even more. It's it's more of just like a creative place. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of what... Uh, that's just kind of what I'm thinking about right now. That's what's in, in my mind. But speaking about the right now, the here and now, I wanted to ask you, John, yeah. what right now have you been enjoying in the media world? So, uh, I got a couple of quick ones, uh, just with my work schedule and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in football season. We're in college football season. I'm living in the South, so that is a very big thing. So, that just means I my the hotel that I work at is owned by a major university. Oh. So, this is a very busy time for us. So, it's what a lot of just... What teams do you guys like? Manchester United, Arsenal, Liverpool. Oh, uh, you know, uh, I'm more, I'm more of a Man U guy uh, myself. <laughs> you know, I do. I always, uh, I love the the, the Welshies though. So. <laughs> oh, you like Swansea City or Cardiff FC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm more of a Cardiff guy myself. Uh, but you know, that's just because uh, when I visited there, they're very, very I just sweet. figured if any, uh, if any, if any uh, people outside of the Americas are listening, I thought I'd throw in a bit of a football versus football joke. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. People ask me about uh, any sort of sports, and I just kind of shut down. 
I'm not the biggest sports guy. I could fake a conversation, but that's because people I follow will talk about sports sometimes. So I, I just steal their talking points. I like to think of you as the as the type of American guy who will say like if a guy comes up and he's talking about american football and he's like oh do you see the football game i like to think of you as the like the cheesy shit did and grin american guys like yes i watched uh the soccer game yeah <laughs> like even though i, I not... do like to mess with people my favorite thing is to pretend like i have no idea so i'll be like oh yeah um yeah they shot some some good goals the other <laughs> the other day um Made a good touchdown, I heard. I think the yep. the best version of that joke um, is a comedian called Chris Thedea, um, who constantly talks about how much he hates sports, and he talks <laughs> about how much like he he like thinks sports are completely lame, and he has this bit on a podcast I listen to where he's talking about how how how. Uh, baseball i couldn't even remember the name of the sport it's so weird how like sports are so regional like i was like what is the american sport with the bat <laughs> how, he's talking about baseball how much baseball is the worst sport ever and he starts being like yeah these players they don't know anything and he's just naming like so, so many players like tons and tons and tons and tons of players who are all real real like actual baseball players so like the it's just like his knowledge of the sport is so vast and so deep, but he keeps saying he doesn't like it. <laughs> I think that's the best version is when you know so much about something, but act like you're completely oblivious. To it. Oh yeah. It's like, um, there's this great meme, whatever. That's like two guys, um, shaking. It's two hands shaking, whatever. Okay. And it's like, one side is people who hate anime. The other side is people who like anime. And in the middle is making fun of people who like anime. <laughs> That is so true. <laughs> uh, just, but sorry, um, currently, you. oh no. Um, so just recently, this one's a very like I don't have much to say about it. Just that it's fantastic. Okay. Uh, the Messenger hmm. on Switch. Oh. It's like a Ninja Gaiden. So far, I'm pretty early on in the game. I think I've gotten through two, three, two bosses maybe. Okay. Um, and it's very much so far. It's kind of like a Ninja Gaiden type game like an old like 8-bit um game where you're this this ninja who's called, who is the messenger you're supposed to take this scroll to this mountaintop um and something 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 whatever there's other stuff going on but like the <laughs> like the story the story is really like interesting kind of funny because it's like there's this demon army whatever that's a te- that's destroyed the world whatever and you're in the last remnant of civilization okay and so the demons come back, and then the hero, the Western hero, arrives um, and kind of fights back the demons. And he's like, "All right, I need you to take this scroll to the mountaintop so that we can defeat the demon army, or whatever." So it's like, "All right, cool." And then, about like a little bit through the first level, you meet, you go into this like little like interdimensional shop thing. Okay. And you meet the character called the shopkeeper, and he's just hilarious. He just makes a lot of fourth wall breaking type jokes. <laughs> And every time you go in there, you just start, you got some options of like you upgrade and then you can chat with them. And there's always this one part called tell me a story. Okay. And so it's just this bit that they do where he tells a long, complicated story. And the ninja at the end of it's just like, oh, so like this was the message, right? Of like, you know, why you told me the story. And he's like, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it's just a story. Like there's no message behind it. <laughs> he's like, you wanted to hear a story, right? That it's sounds, and it's uh, it's so clever. It sounds a lot like it's kind of building on the whole shovel knight genre of like Very taking much. these old kind of games and like writing love letters to them, but also kind of making fun of them in a loving way as well. Like I'm looking yeah. at pictures of it right now, and it looks very much like like hey, remember Ninja Gaiden? This is like a really pretty modern version of Ninja Gaiden. <laughs> and it's so like the controls are so tight. And I get so mad at myself because I'm just like, oh, like I messed that up five times in a row. And there's this little guy who, like, I think his name's Corbel or something. He just like he's a, he's the person who like he's anytime you die, he shows up and he's just like, hey, you got to give me a whole bunch of these collectibles, or whatever, um, and then I'll go away. <laughs> and he's basically <laughs> he's basically just the thing that saves you every time so that you don't ever die. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, like the in-game uh, version for why you don't constantly die all the time. 
But mm-hmm. every time you die, he has a snide remark. <laughs> and I, oh, he pisses. Sometimes he'll be like, oh, man, this is 49 times already. You should probably go to the shopkeeper. Oh, that's a lot of attention to detail. I like that. Yeah. And it'll be, and you have to collect time shards so that he goes away. He's like, all right, this is your debt of how much you owe me for saving your life. Um, and so he'll be like, oh, I've already eaten 496 time shards by now. Like, <laughs> I'm getting a little indigestion. So it's just, it's got such a great humor. Um, but it's definitely, like you said, a love letter to those types of games. That's cool. I'm, I like I like this situation. I like that the Switch is kind of, you know, because a lot of people have been like, you know, the Switch is a perfect console to play these old games on, like where you can bring these old games back. But their answer to that has been kind of like, yeah, we can do that. Or we can make new versions of these old games that you love. It's like kind of indie heaven. Yeah, 100%. Like independent heaven. Like, oh my gosh. It's like anytime I see a trailer for a cool game, I go, is it on Switch? Because it's my first way I want to play it because it's just so much easier. Like, I can be sitting on the couch with my daughter and have the Switch on. She can, like, have be watching TV or playing soccer or whatever. And it's like, it's just so much easier than, like, let me hook up the PlayStation 4, turn it to a specific, you know, setting. <laughs> I'm the only one who can use the TV at that point. Like, it's just so much work. I think there's definitely, for me anyway, um, like, a. a a type of game that I really want to play on the Switch and a type of game that I really want to play on, like, my PlayStation. So, yeah. like, I've been playing Zelda a lot, obviously. Like, that game takes ages to get through. <laughs> oh, yeah. And um, I've had it since I... Pretty much since I had the, the Switch because I, I got it and then it was lent to me almost immediately. Um, and I've been trying to get through it. But I usually prefer... Like, if I'm playing it, I'll sit down and I'll put it on the dock and I'll play it you know on my tv because it's like i want to see everything i want to experience all the beautiful stuff but any kind of side scroller or anything like that i'll just be like there's no point playing this on my tv like i I would get way more enjoyment just i'll even like sit down on the sofa and play it sitting on the sofa in a handheld mode with the tv in front of me just off like that's yeah. how much I prefer it, and I think it goes back to when I used to play Spider Man on the Game Boy and like Rain Man on the yeah. Game Boy. Like as a kid, you just like those types of games. Really, you grow to like play them that way. So it it really does fit in with the situation, especially if the game will let me move with the D pad instead of the analog sticks. Oh um, yeah, I am. Um, I'm. I'm such. I I had a PS One, so like that is my like core like i love d-pad and the buttons like i i'll use the analog stiff if, if that has to you know if that's what you have to do but like sonic um uh mania which i have for the playstation but i wish i had it for the switch um yeah. that is a game that i will play with the d-pad because just as a kid i played the first sonic game with the d-pad so why change now <laughs> you know i like fighting games as well as like a good d-pad thing yeah like i've also been playing god of war recently and i couldn't imagine playing that in handheld mode that would be so weird (laughs) oh yeah no oh i wish i i'm so like i really want spider-man and like i'm so behind on like i haven't played god of war yet and i know like that game will get me i have one game that is like a triple a game that i actually own um and and the rest of the games that came out this year, I'm just borrowing them. I just can't. Yeah. I'm not at a point anymore where I can. God, oh, I'm borrowing from a friend. Eventually, I will find someone who will lend me Spider Man. Hopefully, uh, <laughs> Legend of Zelda. I'm borrowing, and that came out last year. So, like, that's the situation I'm in right now. So, I completely feel you. <laughs> and then my second current fave um, is Riverdale season two. Okay. I watched season one of Riverdale. Um, and then season two starts showing up on TV, and I just don't have the schedule to watch things week to week. Okay. So I'm just like, all right, season two is on Netflix now, so we're working our way through season two. And this show is just so, so stylish mm. and so ridiculous. <laughs> like, it's just so, oh my, so, so much happens, and it's just like, it's takes everything so seriously like there's literally there's a drug in the show called the jingle jangle (laughs) and they say this with a straight face i'm like oh these kids are using the jingle jangle and i'm like what is going on here i am i've never but it's so entertaining i've never really read an archie comic 
So when Riverdale started coming out, I was like, oh, that's an interesting concept. I, I get that Archie really wasn't like Riverdale, so it's funny that they've kind of gone this way with the show instead of just, you know, making an Archie TV show. Um, so it was like such a weird, like completely disconnected thing for me. And I never thought it would really make its way to Britain because Archie has never really made its way to Britain. I never yeah. thought that Riverdale would. But then Netflix bought the rights, the British rights to it so that it comes out weekly on Netflix in Britain, like, uh, like Star Trek Discovery does, but over there it mm-hmm. comes out on like CBS All Access. CBS All Access. Uh. Yeah. So, um, so what happened then is a bunch of people that had no idea that, that it was based on anything just started watching Riverdale as if it's just like a teen drama, not knowing yeah. like what it was. Um, so I have a bunch of friends that like love Riverdale and I'm like, oh, like, do you know, do you like read Archie? And they're like, what the hell is Archie? And I'm like, <laughs> what the hell is Archie? So it's like an interesting experience for me because like Riverdale's huge now over here. It's like a big, big Netflix show that a lot of people love and like, w- like we'll tune in weekly to watch. Um, and I'm just in this weird parallel where I'm like, well, what do I do? I get into it or do I get into Archie comics? Like, what the- don't, I know- you don't need to get into Archie comics. <laughs> I know there is like an Archie comic now that is a bit more mature. Like it's they're all teenagers or something. Um, yeah, there's that one's written by Mark Wade. Which I've heard good things about. Um, but my thing is, if you're going to get an Archie, um, Afterlife with Archie. Okay. Because it's, right. ba- it's basically like, the zombie apocalypse happens in Riverdale. <laughs> oh my goodness. I mean, they, they're probably like two seasons off that in the show. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't wait for because Chilling Adventures of Sabrina is supposed to be coming to Netflix. Ooh. And it's Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Now that is something that I know about because Sabrina the Teenage Witch, the TV show with um, Melissa Joan Hart, was is that is that right? Melissa yeah, Joan Hart? Melissa yeah. Joan Hart. Yeah, she that was amazing. I love Salem. Oh, yeah. Salem, and I can't like... wait for this like Riverdale, Twin Peaks type horror vibey Sabrina show. I, I I'm excited to see it. I I think it's it has potential to really work if they really do like acknowledge the fact that you know a lot of people know it through the tv show as well as the comic um i just wish that i hope that salem's in it like in some way oh yeah like that would be no that's my wife's like make or break it if that cat's not in it she's not watching it <laughs> and i would be interested to see if he's still a puppet as well yeah be cool because i thought that <laughs> was like great. as a kid i loved puppets and they was they were kind of being phased out by the time we were like growing up it was more leaning towards the cg situation so yeah. to have that cat be a puppet so much and to be such an animated one as well was oh. just really cool. Um, but what are, what are you bopping with these days? Dude, I'm sorry that I, I – before I go into mine, I, I feel like I trampled over yours a little bit. I was just excited hearing about oh. yours. So um, anyway, <laughs> I just wanted to no, issue that's great. Like, Mine are not ones that needed a lot of uh, description, <laughs> needed a lot of conversation about. Funny enough, I also have – a game and a Netflix show, so so let's get into it. I recently played, as I mentioned, Detroit: Become Human, um, which is the latest David Cage uh, game. David Cage is a yeah. is a is a character who is is very divisive in the gaming community. A lot oh, of people like his yeah. games. A lot of people dislike his games. A lot of people like his games but don't like him. I personally don't know anything about him other than the fact that he makes games that I very much do like. Um, I had a friend come over while I was playing Detroit. I was like in the early stages of the game, and he was like, "I don't get it. It's just like a choose your own adventure situation." And I was like, "That's the appeal. <laughs> like that is what it is. Like if you if you look at it and go, this is a choose your own adventure game, and you say that as a negative, then I can't get you into the games. But that's just what yeah. I love it for. Like I." I've never played Fahrenheit, but I started with Heavy Rain, and I really liked Heavy Rain. And then I played Beyond Two Souls, which is probably the least, like, um, choose-your-own-adventure one, because this kind of... Beyond Two Souls is quite a, a linear game. It, it, there's not a lot of, like, situations where you can change or make... You definitely can make choices, but it doesn't change the story as much as, as his other games. Um, like Heavy Rain, there's, like, a bazillion different endings. Whereas, yeah, I... Uh... If I remember correctly in Heavy Rain, um, the FBI agent guy died yep. in my playthrough. <laughs> well, this is the funny thing. People always ask me, like, oh, you know, you like David Cage. What happened in your Heavy Rain game? And I will always tell them, well, um, 
Ethan, the father, got arrested. Madison accidentally jumped out of a window. And then the FBI <laughs> guy got punched so hard he fell off a crane and died. Jeez. So, so like, and then, and then because of that, the, the killer wins, effectively. I don't know how morbid that sounds, but he wins. And then Ethan kills himself in prison. <laughs> it was like the worst. Wow, the you had ever. the worst. In, you had the darkest timeline. Like, Mine, like everyone else's stories, went fine, except for the <laughs> FBI guy. I just missed one little thing, and he got knocked into like a, a tr- or some sort of like machinery or whatever and died. <laughs> but like, because it was, I feel like, because that was my first experience with the David Cage game, and because it went so poorly, and then the game ended, it didn't go, would you like to replay? I was like shocked. I was like, oh my god, that actually was the game. And like the game is over and the credits are rolling. It let me do that. And I think that was such a big experience for me because there was never been a game before that actually did that where the game ended with you absolutely ruining the game. And there wasn't yeah. like some kind of like cutscene where it was like, you were supposed to lose. This is now the rest of the game. You know, like it yeah. just kind of ended. So that's kind of what got me into it. And then Beyond Two Souls, I think, is probably his best game that I've ever played really Personally. a lot of people don't like that one because i was so gonna say you were in a small camp with yes. that i i understand but i played that game uh, with with my now wife jenny and she it's kind of like a two-player game it's it's almost like i feel like it's designed to be a two-player game but a lot of people play it by themselves yeah. um and it's such an interesting experience because it's this it's the it's the, i think the only game really where you can play this choose your own adventure game and there's one character but it's two players because of the spirit because of the ghost yeah. whereas like i know people who play like um um heavy rain uh, multiplayer and i played detroit multiplayer because because um jen was playing the, the female character and i played the male characters but it's still not the same as both playing technically the same person just one of you yeah. is the soul because what you can do is 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 i'll show you an example i was i had the hots for this guy i was playing the game and i really liked this boy and i wanted like you know romance him he's this like this handsome dude and he's like in the military and like he protected me and stuff so i'm 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 playing the girl and i'm like i like this guy let's let's make out so i'm making out with him and then it gets to a point where jenny is released from my body and she's the spirit but jenny didn't like him and jenny didn't like the idea of 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 the character romancing this guy so she started throwing books at him (laughs) so we're making out well jenny the ghost is throwing books at him and then he gets freaked out and runs away and then that completely ends my relationship with him and it's like this interesting dynamic where i have got this goal and jenny's got this goal and we're both in the same body but we're just you know we're two different types of players yeah and it, it created this interesting dynamic and also i think he tells stories about real interesting things so like in beyond two souls he talks a lot about poverty and what it's like to be like absolutely 100 percent like a poor homeless person in a, you know a first world country and it's just quite harrowing like there's this level where it's snowing and you've got nowhere to go and you're kind of taken in by this this group of homeless people i don't want to get too much into that i wanted to talk about detroit yeah um, detroit kind of split the difference for me it was like heavy rain crossed with beyond two souls because i felt like it was more towards the gameplay of heavy rain he's getting back to that idea of you play as multiple characters and any of them can die and the story will carry on you know and like at some points they interact but they also have their own stories however it felt like he was still telling the the messages and the stories that he that he was telling with beyond two souls so he still talks about serious issues which i feel like he didn't much in heavy rain like there's a lot about um you know ai and about you know should we consider them as humans you know do you consider ai jenny interestingly enough jenny went into it and i was shocked to hear this but she was like yeah i don't think ai can ever be considered people uh, like she was like i don't think they have a soul and i don't think that they would like if ais did rise up i think i would be on the side that would be like we need to destroy them all and i was really shocked by that because for me growing up with science fiction i've always seen like ai as you know people and as as like a race that can become sentient um so we start playing the game and she's obviously forced to play as an ai character and by the end of the game she's like screaming at these humans <laughs> 
<laughs> like being like what are they doing and i'm like but jen you just think these are machines and she's like it, it doesn't uh, uh, but and she's like <laughs> she's like completely like spun around so i think it's interesting how the game did have this actual impact on on jen like like i went into it in kind of a weird situation where well, I, I feel like a lot of people go into a lot of movies like this or, or games where you have the same um opinions as the person making it so you don't yeah. really have that opportunity to be turned to be turned around but when you play something or watch something that is kind of going for a different opinion to your own it's this interesting experience where you kind of you kind of have to go oh whoa i'm being thrust into a situation where i'm playing a character that doesn't believe the same things as me you know um so that was cool to watch and i thought detroit was a really good kind of even ground between heavy rain and between uh beyond two souls and i think that he has some really good characters my only gripe with it is just like most david cage games it (laughs) i feel like it ends in a way that is like sequel question mark but Mm -hmm. not without any plans for a sequel like there's lots of interviews with him where he's like i might do a sequel i might not but the game ends in such a way that you're like you it feels like you wanted to make a sequel just like with beyond two souls that ends in a very like whoa is this is gonna a sequel and then he never made one, maybe because of the backlash. But, but it, yeah. it's just, it frustrates me sometimes because it feels like he does this because he doesn't know how to end the game. Like <laughs> I don't know, Heavy Rain. No, had, I can see that. Endings like Heavy Rain had endings and like satisfying and dissatisfying endings, which makes sense. You can't have just satisfying endings in a choose your own adventure game. Yeah, there has to be endings where it's like no. But there were we we messed up a lot in beyond uh, in Detroit. We ended up actively dying twice <laughs> so like two of the characters ended up dead actually dead and then i don't want to spoil the end but it but but the final character oh, yeah had this big big thing at the end that was like kind of like you know what happened question mark but it's never yeah. gonna get answered because he'll just move on and make a different game now so that was a bit frustrating but other than that i thought it was a good good david cage game in terms of david cage games i think it's probably above heavy rain for me but just a little bit below Beyond Two Souls, just because I resonated with that character a lot. So I think that's... the middle is where most people are... It's the, their second. Yes, for, it's, you know. it's funny, though, because most people, it's their second, just like mine, but their first and third... It's is heavy so rain, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My thing about David Cage, um, besides all of the uh, stuff that's going on with the studio and the lawsuits and stuff like that, um, okay. about like the work environment, it's uh, just, I heard a little bit about that. I didn't know much. Yeah, so I believe I believe the last thing I heard was that they got um they were found guilty and so that the of like just harmful practices and stuff like that. But besides all of that stuff, which I've not done my research and looked up on mm. to talk this about is like it. When we talk about already. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I always keep on getting myself in situations where I'm like, I do not have all the information. <laughs> It's just, I just, uh, David Cage is a storyteller for me. Yeah. I think he's good at, he has great characters and great, like, you know, situations that are very much worked really well for, like, a choose your own adventure game. Mm. I just hate it when he tries to tackle issues. Okay. Because I feel like he's very heavy handed. Very much so. Yeah. Very heavy handed. Uh, I believe Detroit uses the I have a dream speech. The. <laughs> <laughs> it does it doesn't use the i have a dream speech so much as... it uses bits of it right like yeah the, there's uh there's a section of the game it's all a very <laughs> it is a very heavy-handed game and a lot of his games are but there's a section of the game where you have to choose what you want a graffiti on the walls as as the android revolutionary is i have a dream one of those one of them is i've i have a dream <laughs> another one is i think therefore i am um <laughs> The way I justified it when I was playing in my mind, and I didn't even have to justify it. This is just what I thought. It wasn't until afterwards yeah. that I was like, oh, that's a little bit funny. Um, is that these androids are like reaching back to all the past like civil rights, you know, activists and just trying to figure it. They're piecing together their own manifesto using, yeah. you know, these peoples. Um, that is an excuse, obviously, but that might not be what he intended. He might have just been like, I can't write, so let's pull from... I, I can't write, so <laughs> Google inspirational quotes. He's like writing a college essay. He's just like... <laughs> like uh. 
<laughs> but um, but I am the type of guy that those stuff works on, and it's not just in in David Cage games. A lot of stuff um that has heavy hand heavy heavy. Whoa, I can't speak. Heavy handed metaphors like will work for me. Like for yeah. example, all the androids on their uniforms, their civ- uh, their uniforms when they're like actually androids and not you know when they've like started to rebel but the ones that are actually working for humans have to wear blue triangles and they have to wear a blue band around their arm uh, yeah. which is very reminiscent of how gay people in Nazi Germany had to wear pink triangles and yeah. pink bands around their arm so it's like he's not subtle but no. I uh, I'm a fan of, of unsubtlety when it comes to yeah. storytelling I like subtlety as well but but as you will find in my next favorite, I I like people who put it all out there. Speaking John of, Way, what is your next favorite? <laughs> Speaking of, I finished finally, even though it's been done for f- ages. I finally finished the Get Down. If you don't know uh. what the Get Down is, it is a is a Baz Luhrmann series about the seventies hip hop culture when DJing became was first becoming a thing. And when hip hop was was kind of becoming a genre, it wasn't even really a genre. It was just kind of a thing that people did and never even knew could become music. That's all cool. Story, characters, that's all interesting. I very much enjoyed it. What I wanted to talk about was Baz Luhrmann's approach to uh, making a visual story. Because he does something interesting in The Get Down. Um, which he's done a little bit in, in previous works of his. Um, Moulin Rouge and and Romeo and Juliet and The Great Gatsby have hints of this, but The Get Down was very much the first time that I saw him go full on, which is I don't care about the format of storytelling, uh, of, of visual storytelling anymore. I'm just going to do what feels right in the moment. So the, so the Get Down, have you watched any of The Get Down, John? I have not, mostly because it was one of those things where I'm like, I should start this. And then I heard that they weren't getting a second season. And I'm like, ah, maybe I don't want to start it. To be fair, it it's finished. Like, it, whether or not they told him before he finished, you know. Um, but it does get an end. Like, there's no... Okay, that's good. Anything. That's so, always my worry. Is like, I don't want to get in something that doesn't necessarily have an end. Yeah. And then it, I just feel... It, I was worried about that too, but it does get a very final ending. Like this is the end. I they could do a second season. Obviously, anything can have yeah. a second season. But it, but it felt to me when I watched maybe because I I knew that there was no there was not a next season while I was watching it. But it felt to me like oh this is the end. Um, but 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 the get down it, it tells its story very much however it wants uh, and 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 somewhat consistently but also inconsistently which is kind of what i love about it so so you'll start the episode and generally it will start with the this <laughs> i'm just going to go through an episode with you as fast as i can <laughs> and this will give you an example so it starts with a modern day rapper on stage rapping about um his life as a kid right so you can kind of piece together you go okay this is probably the main character as an adult and he's kind of telling us the story and then it'll cut back to, you know, the main story of the yeah. get down, which is kind of him as a child. So it's a cool framing device, right? So yeah. right now I'm like, okay, fair enough. It's a little bit off the wall, but it's a cool framing device. Then it'll cut, but it won't cut straight to the actors, you know, acting out like the get down. First, it will cut to real actual news footage and, and B-roll from the time so from the 70s actual b-roll and it'll be flicking through b-roll and you'll hear like voices over the top of of news presenters that from the time so they're actual news broadcasting and immediately you're kind of like whoa what is going on i feel like i'm watching a documentary all of a sudden yeah and then what it'll do is intercut footage from the actual show but with the same grain as the footage you're watching so all of a sudden, you're kind of like, it's breaking down the wall between the real footage and the fake footage so much that when it eventually does get to the show, you're sucked in and you can't like, you, you can't actually tell the difference. Like, you're not dumb, but, but you, you, your viewing brain is in it 
in a way that yeah. it wouldn't be if they didn't do this. So right now you're like this guy existed, and and I kept having to Google. I kept I did this about three times. Is the get down based on a real person? <laughs> like, <laughs> and there's a lot of speculation that it might be, but it's never really confirmed. And none of the characters have like names that are real names. So that's it's interesting that it had that effect on me. But then further from that, what happens is there's these there's these voiceovers. There's these kind of like you know we're talking about what's happening right now and it's usually Zeke the main character because he's a poet as well as a rapper and he'll be reading out one of his spoken word poets uh, poems and it'll be about the event and then he'll say the title of the episode sometimes and a bus w- uh, not a bus a train will roll up a uh, roll across the screen and you think it's b-roll footage again from the time from the 70s but then you realize the graffiti down the side of the bus will be the name of the episode <laughs> so it's like it's like he integrates storytelling in such an interesting visual way where you don't ever really know what you're watching and then and then in season two well not season two but part two because the season was released in part one and part two um it's still all one season but in part two he introduces animation and it just goes off the wall it gets absolutely (laughs) crazy so he, he introduces animation but in a way that is like hey, this is actually happening in the context of the show, but you never know if it's happening in the way it is you're watching it. Because, like, there's a scene where a character's like, right, you guys go do this, and I'll go get our friend from uptown. So that's in live action. And then all of a sudden, they'll cut to animation, and then the guy is on his motorcycle going uptown to get his friend, and he's, like, jumping off, like, ramps, and he's going through, like, rings of fire, and he's, like, doing, like, flips and shit, and he's, like, running over people. Well, he's not actually running over people, but he's, like, weaving in amongst people, doing all this stuff that they would never show in live action. And, like, for example, one of the ones is, like, this, they, in the animation, they steal a trolley, and they, they're, like, they're zipping down the roads and the trolley is going like 100 miles an hour and there's fire coming out of the bottom of the trolley. So you're like, this is cool. It's like a fun animation, like a fake representation of what's actually happening, but it's not happening this way. But then in the next scene where it is live action, they'll be at the place they got to, but they'll have the trolley. And you're like, what? <laughs> I thought the trolley... You're like, wait a minute, did <laughs> Yeah, you're like, did that actually metaphor. happen? <laughs> like, so what he does is he makes these these episodes that they don't really care whether or not they're realistic they kind of switch between the most real shit you've ever seen in your life and then things that you don't actually know whether or not it's happening but not in a in a pretentious like ooh, is this character seeing it in his own mind way it's never yeah. like that it's just he, it's almost like he said this it's like he sat down and was like i'm gonna make a story that is set in a version of the 70s but i don't care whether or not it is realistic, but I want it to feel real. So he's like, well, he's I thrown... Think... Sorry, carry on. I was say, I think that's something that Baz Luhrmann, one of my favorite things about them is that it's every it's heightened reality. Mm. And I feel like this sounds like the most... Because if you think about like Moulin Rouge, yeah. like the scene where they take absinthe, <laughs> where they drink absinthe, like they see like the green pixie and all this stuff. And it's all like at like two times speed. Yeah, <laughs> like everything that's happening, whatever. And this sounds like the most like extreme version of that, like idea of the like heightened reality of like, especially with him in regards to music. It seems like he very much sees music as a way to, you know, make make our reality fantastical and make it more than it is. You know, yeah. make it exciting and make it um, a little bit, you know, unrealistic. You know, in a way. And so it's it's interesting that this is a show about musicians and about music and he does go that far with the animation and stuff yeah and, and i think moulin rouge is a great starting point as well because it's one of his earlier films to look at that and where it's like you know when they drink absinthe it's almost feels now after watching the get down that he would have done that scene now but they wouldn't be intoxicated it would just yeah. be happening because i think he's less worried about the how and more worried about the actual it happening you know yeah he, he doesn't care about he, ne- he no longer cares about telling the audience why they're seeing these weird things he's like no it doesn't matter why they're seeing it what matters is what they're seeing you know so that's what i really like about the get down it almost feels like he's taken what he what i thought were my favorite parts of moulin rouge you know because he does that in moulin rouge there's bits where they're dancing and crazy shit is happening and they're not drunk 
it's just it's yeah. just crazy stuff is happening but it feels like he's gone all in on that now and he's for, he's 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 not caring about explaining himself he's just being himself which is really cool um yeah. so i really enjoyed the get down i recommend it if you are like a, a visual storyteller like who is who's like always like oh but are people gonna like think i'm weird for doing this or are people gonna like need an explanation i'm like no baz Luhrmann proves that you don't need to explain yourself just do like there's a character who is called shaolin fantastic right it's not his real name but that's what he goes for. yeah and he constantly gets into fights he fights like a karate kung fu master and every time he fights there is a mortal combat announcer <laughs> talking about him like shaolin fantastic he's got the punch oh and they're down but it, ah! it's, it's never addressed one who this announcer is two, yeah how this character knows kung fu <laughs> like <laughs> but he just you don't care because you're just enjoying it and you realize watching it why do i care about where it where it comes from or what it means like it, it just what matters is that it's happening and what does what what ha- is happening why that impacts the story you know so yeah i've just i very much had a good time with it and it, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this but you watch something and just really respected the chances that they took you know the, yeah the, the like the the fucks that they didn't give when making something <laughs> exactly so, so after speaking that, of that, not giving any fucks ooh. <laughs> what we're is killing your... it on the segways <laughs> what is your topic for today Jean? so um senior greg miller um Ooh. is a big superman fan he posted a video um well as a part of one of their normal shows whatever where he pitched his idea of the perfect superman game okay he's been talking about making this video for a long time and then he finally was just like all right you know what we're just gonna make it a topic and i'm just gonna talk about it and I was like, oh, man, this is really fun and cool. I mm. should pitch a character that doesn't really get great video games like Superman that I care a lot about. Okay. So I have a pitch for a Green Lantern video game. Mm. And I'd love to see if this would be something interesting, if I'm going along the right path, maybe helping with some story decisions and stuff. Because I've got I, most of my information that I've got is a lot of mechanically how it would work. That's good though. That's a good place to start. I found that in the past, I start with the story, and then I realize that games aren't built really on the story. <laughs> yeah, and I realize the main thing that you have to get through with a Green Lantern game is the mechanics. Yes, there's so, so I... much lore and so much history to to pull from that you can make a great story, but the mechanics of how the world works is the interesting thing. I want to, before you start, say that I have played a Green Lantern video game. It might be the well, only green. There was one game. around the movie, right? Yes. So 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 I played that game. I played it all the way through Rise um, of the Manhunters, I think. Yes, that's the one. Rise of the Manhunters. Yeah. I played it all the way through with a friend. Um did you play that game? Um, I've seen footage of it. I never actually played it, but it looked like a beat 'em up kind of. Yeah, so it was an interesting take. It it felt very safe, I will say. Yeah. But I will say that for what it was it, it didn't reach too far because I because we were get, going through this phase where we thought we'd play s- superhero video games, me and my friend uh, Reese, and we thought we'd like rate them all and, and see what they are. As far yeah. as superhero video games go, it was pretty good because it didn't reach too far. So a, a, a comparison is we played the Thor game, and the Thor game felt like it was trying to be God of War, and it was terrible. It was <laughs> awful. <laughs> but <laughs> but the Green Lantern game, it knew what it was. It was a beat-em-up, and it used the ring in an interesting way where you could unlock like shapes. Like, you yeah. could unlock a mallet, you could unlock a gun, you could unlock you know, like the, the classic Green Lantern shapes that he would use. You know, some from the movie, some from the comics. Um... So I'd be interested to see, because I felt like that game did the best it could without getting too complicated, because uh, it's such a confusing character to make a video game yeah. about, because you can literally make anything. Like... <laughs> yeah, that is a, a hard problem. So what are you, what are you, what is your solution? What is your video game idea? All right, so it's Space Cops, yeah. right? <laughs> it's the vast, wild, crazy world of the DC Universe. How hard can this be? It should be very simple, I think, for any developer out there. So, like, the idea is you're creating your own Green Lantern. You're creating just name, race, origin, and a couple of, like, pre-chill... Kind of, like, think Dark Souls or Bloodborne. 
where it's like or like what is your um your story of how you got your ring and there's some pre-decided like oh you were you were in a battle you were you're a soldier or maybe you were like you know a a scholar who is in like a horrible situation or you know some pre-chosen scenarios to kind of like and then i'll kind of decide like oh you're like general you know build and all that normal character customization stuff i believe that dragon age does a similar thing where you choose like your back yes yeah oh dragon age inquisition one of my favorite games i, I love that game um i didn't play any of the other ones funny enough before yeah, i played it <laughs> So um, you start off on Oa. You're the first of a new class with Kilowog. Um, I like the idea of the power battery meaning something. That is my biggest gripe with Green Lantern. They introduce a great concept of the power battery, oh, yeah. and then just pretend like the battery never runs out. <laughs> Funny enough, I'm... the only thing that I remember it being like, wow, they actually have to charge their rings, was the yeah. movie. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, I think the TV, the animated show. I think yes. they, yeah, yeah. I've been told they did a really good job about that. Um, but I want, so I want it to be kind of like, have you ever played Fortnite? Yes, I have played Fortnite. Okay, so you know how their building system works? Ooh, I didn't I want it to be that. like that. So, but instead of, like, ingredients, it says how much it'll take down your power, like, percentage. Ah, so you want to build a wall that's 5%, 3%, whatever, of your power battery. Mm. Um, and so I want there, like, and once it empties out, you really just have to find cover and, like, you know, just wait for it to char- just charge it back up and just don't get hit. But I just want it to be something that you're consciously thinking about. Like, sure, do you want to throw out giant missiles all the time? Your power battery is going to empty quick. Or, like, are you going to, you know, build up walls and try and, like, do some other other ways around combat? Mm-hmm. Uh, I imagine it's, like, a third-person, you know, game. Yeah, so instead of the the technique that the... Green Lantern Rise of the Manhunters game used, where it's like, you can only use a technique once you've unlocked it. You would kind of go for the idea of, hey, you've got all these techniques and you can use them all now, but if you use Nuclear Bomb, you're not going to have anything else <laughs> left. You have to I, like, I, pick and choose. I think at the beginning, I'd give you like simple ones yes. um, that are just like your starter ones, and then probably as you do more missions and stuff, um, you can your power battery expands or whatever your you know your your level goes up and it's like oh you've gained access to new constructs you know some dumb thing like that to give you some progression but it would be less about like hey uh, now that i've unlocked this awesome one i'll just use that one all the time yeah you exactly wouldn't be able to do that you would have to like choose your moment which I think is good because it adds to the fun. You're not just running through and going, oh, bomb, 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 bomb. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not just walking around like giant mech armor suit all the time. <laughs> I would love to do that one, like have giant mech armor suit, but that is one that will immediately take it down to zero. But yeah. you can use it for, it. like it has its own maybe like willpower life bar or whatever. And once that runs out, it's like, okay, it's destroyed. You're out of power battery now. You need to charge up. Yeah, 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 so it's like if there's like a big enemy, but he's the only one left. You're like, okay, this is the time to use it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, basically, like, and I want there to be like a general, um, attack, whatever. That's like either maybe like maybe you get to choose like a melee weapon or something, or it's just like little bullet things. Yeah, I get what you say. They're like, kind of like this is your general, your general blasts, like your general attack. They take down maybe one. You know, a little power battery, like, barely take it down. Just something that doesn't take a lot of damage, but you can use when you are really low on power battery. Yeah, I like that idea, because it's like, it would be like using bullets in Fortnite. Like, if, if you yeah. are thinking of it like Fortnite, you know, well, I guess bullets still do take a different source of ammunition. But just imagine, like, you know, it's like a melee, att- like you said, a melee attack, like... Like in Dark Souls, it does take your, um, what's the word, your, um... Yeah stamina down but it's not the same as you using a magic weapon or something like that yeah it's like minimal yeah I get what you're saying. um so then after that i don't like the idea again me and the power battery i'm just i don't think introducing something like that and then just throwing it to the side really makes sense so you get you get a spaceship okay instead of you know like flying using your ring all the time that would drain your battery like that doesn't make sense Ooh. um and i like the idea of you having a ship that you can customize um, you're assigned a sector that's like, all right, this is your sector. 
and I kind of want this part to be like No Man's Sky. Oh, okay. So, like, you're in your spaceship, and you're like, all right, you've got three planets that you can go to. Three, four, five, whatever, like, planets you can go to um, in your sector. And then those planets themselves have just missions and stuff and side things that you can do. Hmm. And so, like, I love this idea of just, like, you you go to a planet, and you're like, all right, cool. I'm going to hunt after, like, this bounty or whatever, this, like, this bad guy who's, like, hidden on this planet or whatever. Or I'm going to... My thing was, I was, like, overall story, I was thinking, like, halfway through, like, you introduce the Sinestro core. Okay. So then you can get some ring construct versus ring construct battles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see at the beginning, like... Maybe having what was it the Black Spider Syndicate? Uh, maybe <sighs> what, what, whoever Abinsur's son, Abinsur's son was a part of like that. Oh evil yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, I was thinking that group could be like a of like villains in the beginning, mm. of like they're making like terrorist attacks and stuff like that, and you're trying to like halt them and stop them and stuff like that. Like day to day, what you think the Green Lanterns would fight? Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah, and I like the idea of, like, I don't like having Salak, you know, call yeah. you on your ring and being like, hey, um, you're on this planet. Could you get some information about the local stuff so we can just fill up our um, our archives or whatever? And so you can go and, like, if you want to, like, collect plants and stuff and scan objects and, like, just, like, you know, log stuff in, like, your directory or whatever. Yeah, I like I like the idea of that. I like the idea that it is like um, it's almost like you didn't play Andromeda, did you? Mass Effect Andromeda. I a little bit. I didn't play a lot. So you know how like there are multiple planets in Andromeda, but like when you land on a planet, it becomes open world. Yeah. Like it's like, and then there's like multiple missions to do in there, and you can meet people, and they'll give you quests. So it's like lots of different separate open worlds. I guess Inquisition is exactly the same. It's just instead of planets, yeah. it's places. So you would like you'd land on a planet, and then all of a sudden, this is an open world, and and this world is filled with side quests and stuff like that. And then yeah, I like very planet. much like a Bioware game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get you. It would be cool as well because you could like do side like villains. That would yeah. to do with the main story, which would always be obviously be like Sinestro Core. Like um, I'd have to have Lobo show up as like a side branch that you can go off onto. Yeah. And just so like, be like one of the planets you like turn up at like a village or something. Say it's like a primitive planet where like they don't have a lot of technology. And like they're like, hey, this fucking dude on a motorcycle keeps terrorizing us. So you like follow the lead. You like you go here, you go there, you go there, and then all of a sudden you find him, and it's like a big boss battle with Lobo, and then you beat it. And this is all optional stuff, but if you beat him, yeah. you get something really cool. And then it's like, oh well, this is how. Oh, maybe you get story. like a construct of his motor. You decide like I'm gonna make a construct of his <laughs> motorcycle or whatever, or something <laughs> that like that. <laughs> yeah, and like Atrostus would be a good one as well because you could have, you wouldn't have to have the whole red lantern core but you could yeah. like set it up by having atroscus be like a side boss and then be like i'll get you in the next game <laughs> yeah basically but i just love the idea of like because i've always said that like the worst thing about green lantern Island is when you focus on how jordan okay yeah, yeah, yeah um i love how jordan and jeff john's green lantern run is my favorite comics run of all time <laughs> <laughs> but I don't love Hal Jordan, and I also think that the Green Lantern Corps as a whole is so interesting that you don't need to be focused. Like I hate it when it's like, oh, we're on Earth all the time, and Earth's the most important place. I'm like, yeah. there's a whole galaxy. Like there's the the third, the fourth world, and like the new gods, and like all this cool, interesting stuff. Mm. Just like hanging out on Earth, dealing with like Tattoo Man, <laughs> <laughs> like. Yeah, I agree with you that there's very much a – it's weird that they created this kind of like, like say, galactic space force, you know, and they never really get to do the galactic space part of galactic space force. It just feels like yeah. another fucking superhero sometimes. I think uh, both of us are very much fans of Kyle Rayner, and a yeah. lot of his comics were uh, – Hello and welcome to this issue of Kyle Rayner. He's on the planet that has blue roses, but they're giant, yeah. and and there's yeah. an evil woman wrapped in 
tentacles and 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 you just like would read like this issue and Kylo Rayner would show up on a planet he would fight this person he would learn a moral lesson like these people would worship him as a god and he have to tell them that he's not and then he would fly off and in the next issue he'd be somewhere else and it was really fun because you're like wow where's Kylo Rayner gonna go next and then like you said I love Hal Jordan's run of um, Green Lantern but a lot of it is like why are we still on Earth? Yeah and like I just think the idea of a Green Lantern game is like Putting yourself in the shoes of a Green Lantern, making up your own race, your own whatever, having your own backstory, and then just going out into the DC universe and just being like, all right, have fun. Like, go out there, explore, be a Green Lantern. What does that mean? What does it mean to, like, overcome fear and teaching, you know, these, like, other civilizations and stuff, whatever, of, like, you know, having, like, a little kid, whatever, and there being, like, this horrible terrorist attack or something and being, like, no, like, you're a Green Lantern too, like, you know, and... Uh, it, it does it's... honestly feel a lot more... It, it, it feels a lot easier to kind of tell those Green Lantern stories. And I don't, I don't mean stories in the sense of, like, actual stories in the comics. I mean, like, stories in the sense of, like, what being Green Lantern means, you know, um, and about overcoming fear and about, you know, it, 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 like, inspiring others and being that protective force it feels easier to do that in a situation where the players have made their character because it's like they yeah. they themselves have to overcome fear you could even if you wanted to go real hardcore in it and assuming this game has like a massive budget like an ea budget oh yeah right you could give it a moral system in which halfway through the game you can become a yellow lantern ah <sighs> Like, that would be be really cool. It would be like, you have to start as a Green Lantern, because that's just the circumstance. Your character, whatever planet you're from, you become a Green Lantern. And you play the game, but throughout the game, you could make really bad decisions, and, like, like the... uh, uh, the guardians could constantly be like, "Hey, you need to you need to shape up. You're not being, you know, the type of lantern that we want you to be." And then maybe, like you said, halfway through the game, you introduce the Sinestro Corps, and it depending and a on ring how, finds you. Yeah, depending and on and you how have you to be like, it. "Ooh, do I want to take this or not?" <sighs> <laughs> and I just think that would be a really cool idea of like, of like, you know, all these games now. Every game has a moral system, but only f- a few of them use it in an interesting gameplay wise. Now, how cool would it be if you're like, hey, I've been evil, right? I love being evil in video games. I've been evil for the first half of the game. Now I have been rewarded for being evil, but yeah. I have to sacrifice all of my com uh, my my constructs that I've built up to this point. And I replace them with these this new weapon that is right now. It would it would be like level one, you know. And yeah. now I have to upgrade this ring, and I have to learn how to use this ring, and it would be different, and and the constructs would be more wild and crazy. And, and now I have to go against the all these people that I've met, and yeah. like, because yeah, I want yeah. you also to be like have a senior lantern <laughs> who's like maybe like Tomare or something, who's like your partner in the sector, yeah, who doesn't yeah, really yeah. like do stuff with you, but you do can go and like talk and hang out with him and like. He'll call you and just be like, hey, how's it going, kid? Uh, yeah, I like that idea. And it's almost like a, a very slimmed down version of a crew, you know, yeah. from from like a Bioware game. But instead of it being like a, a group of people, you are very much the singular hero, but you're part of something bigger. And it's const- the game's constantly reminding you that you are part of something bigger. Because yeah. I, I, I like that. I mean, in games, I, I think sometimes with the first game, they try to go so big that you're like, oh, this is too much. But I like, like when you said, like, four or five planets, it really appealed to me, because that, you know, would be, you know, a Green Lantern only has a sector to to kind of control, and you could, it would be manageable. You would you would kind of learn the planets eventually. You would yeah. learn, like, where everything is. And then you're just like, oh, I found this, like, war over here. Let me go to the, the shop on, you know, Escobar or whatever, and, like, mm. you already, you, like, kind of get used to, like, where you go to talk to people and stuff. And the final fight, is obviously you're gonna you're gonna start like you're gonna start in this giant space battle. You're gonna be like sitting in giant constructs, you know. It's gonna be like a <laughs> big set piece, and you're gonna start seeing that power battery chipping and chipping away, chipping away. And like you're gonna land on Oa, the Snesher course attacked and destroyed all this stuff, trying to destroy the power battery. And like as you're going through, like you're not really getting a chance to recharge. Yeah, because everything's just happening at once. You're just having to run everywhere. Um, and then, like, you're going to, the ending fight is going to turn into, like, just a fist fight between, like, you and Sinestro. 
because that is one of my favorite parts of Sinestro Four Wars when Kyle, Hal, and Sinestro are just fighting in like a construction yard. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. like they've just exhausted their power batteries so much. <laughs> oh man, I love that idea. That's it is similar to Metal Gear Solid Four. That ends in like kind of a fist fight. Oh yeah, Ocelot and Snake. Ah, oh, dude, it's so cool, and I, and I just think that like stuff like that would be. It would be really touching as well to know that it's like it's not Hal Jordan, it's you. Your character yeah. is is fist fighting right now, and you'd be like, "Come on!" Like mashing the buttons, <laughs> like you yeah. do oh. this. And building it into the system of the game would would feel more genuine as opposed to having a game where you can always use constructs, and then all of a sudden, randomly at the end of the game, you you've lost your power. You know, yeah. The fact and that I think you've, you've taught the players how this works it feels more satisfying then because you're like i know why there's no power in my ring now because i I understand what's happened and i think like one of my favorite things like i think something that anime does really well um is it gives you limitations but then it also has you surpass those limitations Mm, yeah yeah. um but giving you limitations of like oh man you're in a fight and goku's decided he's gonna go ko kin while also going blue super saiyan whatever (laughs) like you know like oh crap he can't do that for very long. He's going to wear out his body and he's got another fight coming up. It yeah. adds stakes to something. And when you know that Kakashi could only use the Sharingan for like a certain limited amount of time. <laughs> and so he decides to bust it out and you're like, all right, well, this thing's either going to end or they're screwed. <laughs> it is. And I think that uh, that isn't utilized enough in video games, honestly. Like, I yeah. think... Um... It's it's an interesting concept. I mean, so much so like, you you would you would kind of be making the the the, the kind of like the ultimate cross between an, an RPG like Dragon Age or, or or Mass Effect and some sort of like fighting game, you know, where you're like yeah. gotta be looking at your meter all the time and gotta be making sure you have this thing. And I think it could be work. I could work because honestly, like, there's been a lot in recent you know gaming. Uh, I guess his history but like i mean recent <laughs> um uh that there's been a lot of melding of genres and it going quite well yeah so i think that that could definitely work yeah it sounds interesting my one question would be um how would you deal with like because you've talked about you know villains like that, that's pretty easy you have like the main villain which is sinestro um and you have like like other characters like Kilowog, you know, is your teacher and you have like, you know, a famous Green Lantern. Would you at all deal with the Human Lanterns or would you just leave them out of just like maybe just the first game, just leave them out and just not address them? Part of me wants like, like a off, like some off comments here and there of like, mm-hmm. say you are like kind of breaking the rules and stuff like that. Maybe Salak will be like, oh God, we've got another Jordan on our hands or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if I was going to have one, it would probably be John. Okay. Show up maybe in that big last fight of like John Stewart's fighting alongside you. Just because he's the one who out of the Green Lanterns is the most Green Lantern. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Like him and Guy Gardner, I think, are the ones that are like, no, we like stay at Oa and we like eat in the mess hall and like yeah, we kind of I... like hang out while Kyle and Hal have been more more tend to join the justice league and stuff like that even though you know both of those john and guy have been on those teams and stuff it just seems like john and guy spend more time in space yeah i get what you're saying because kind of all four of them have like baggage but like john's john seems to deal with it the most in my memory of comic books by going into space and being a Green Lantern. That's kind of how he deals with yeah. his, his baggage. And he's like the soldier, the consummate soldier. Yeah, 100%. Like, like Guy very much wavers a lot when it comes to being a Green Lantern. Like, he, he's thrown the ring away, he's become a Red Lantern, he's, you know, he's all over the shop, yeah. Guy Gardner. Like, he's become, what was he, the, what was he called, the warrior or the... Yeah, I know, he was the warrior, yeah. Yeah, Um, and then you've got, like, Hal, which he just never leaves Earth. He's just in love with Carol too much to leave Earth. Yeah. And then Kyle leaves Earth a lot, but he was yeah. the Green Lantern when there was no other Green Lanterns. So it's a yeah. little bit awkward with him because he was like the sole Green Lantern where there was no Green Lantern core. So I've never really seen him in a core setting other than 
like when he was in um Ion? Yeah, he was Ion. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Oh, dude, that was cool. And then he became a White Lantern, which I thought was the best. Yeah, I mean, hit, him at, in that last issue of John's where he's healing people and he's like, Jesus. Uh, it's hey, so Jesus. Cool. I loved it. <laughs> but yeah, you're right. John, I mean, what I was thinking when you said, you know, the five planets originally, it, it wouldn't really work unless your sector partner was John. But how cool would it be if one of the planets was John Stewart's planet? You know, the uh, one that he he kind of governs over for a while. Yeah, like, uh, it, Z- Xandar. Yes, it, it's one of my favorite, like unpopular history moments in Green Lantern. Like no one ever talks about it anymore. But it was like such a big deal that John, John Stewart, Stewart blew up a planet. <laughs> yeah, and like he had. <laughs> A planet that he owned for so long, and then people just go, "Yeah, no, John just do it. It's just another Green Lantern." I'm like, "What? What?" <laughs> um, or even having one of the planets be um, um, ah, oh, what's his name? The planet who's a Green Lantern. Oh, Mo- Mogo. Mogo, yeah, yeah, yeah. that would be. I awesome. love for Mogo to be a planet that. Oh, maybe like, because like maybe in the last battle, Oa does get kind of like fucked and destroyed, and then like you earlier in the game. Maybe like as like a, a secret like extra planet, like that's yeah. not one that you do missions on, but it's just one that you can go to to kind of like talk to Mogo or whatever. It's just like something you can do throughout the game, and then at the end of the game, like he becomes the new home for that the Green Lantern cool. Corps. That'd be that cool. That would be really cool. And like if you choose the evil version of Sinestro, you have to go and like destroy. Him and oh, like... oh. I was going to say, I would not want you to destroy that that (laughs) nice planet. But it would be like the saddest thing ever. Like, Mogo would be there and you'd just be like all shooting at him with yellow beams and he'd be like, no. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) You got to give that like evil gamer things to do as well. (laughs) I don't, I hate those people. I can't do it. (laughs) I can't do it. I tried to replay Fallout 4 recently because I was just bored. And I was like, I played this game so good the first time. The only other way that I can play games is if there's a sarcastic option. So that's oh, all yeah. I can do now. So instead of the good guy, I played as the good guy. I couldn't do the bad guy. So now I'm just the guy that goes, eh, meh, 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 to yeah. everyone. <laughs> that's my problem. Is like I played like a game like The Witcher. And yeah. like Geralt is like this badass, like doesn't take shit. And I'm just like, oh, nice old lady. You don't have to pay me. It's fine. <laughs> I actually really appreciate that God of War doesn't have dialogue option. Oh, yeah. I like Kratos' character, but if I had the choice, he would be like, I love you, son. Yeah. <laughs> but He like, would I'm... stop that boy stuff immediately. Yeah, exactly. But because I'm not given the option, I get to see a compelling character who is a terrible father. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one of my, not to get off on a tangent, um, but one of my favorite things that a video game has done recently uh, was the ending of Last of Us. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was yeah, yeah. where that 100%. game, like, for a second, you're like, okay, I'm going to make a choice, right? <laughs> and then you're like, no, <laughs> you don't get to make this choice. This is what's happening. This is our story that we're telling you. And it's like, oh, shit. That yeah. is that is really good. <laughs> not only do you get to not get to make the choice, you then have to play out yeah <laughs> the the option the game chooses which for. honestly that's the option i would have chose though uh yeah yeah but I, uh, personally it's, ooh, it's tough because like it's not because well, my thing is so like in the game i went and got every single collectible and whatever that you could get mm. and so reading some of the stuff i'm like oh this isn't a guarantee they don't know this is going to work yeah <laughs> I'm nope. I'm murdering them all. I I d- b- here's where here's where um, Naughty Dog gets you right because yes I agree. If it was me, um, if I had the choice, I would probably choose as well like like you to to save. I, we're just gonna spoil it to save Ali. Oh yeah, I'm fucking Last of Us came out like 2013. <laughs> okay, it came out for PS3. That's how long ago yeah. it was. So. So, so I would have chosen to have Ellie, but the little they couldn't leave you with that. They couldn't leave you with that moral quandary. They had to layer one on top, which is when she turns around and she says, "Joe, have you told me everything about um what happened at the hospital?" And Joe goes, 
Joel, sorry. Joel goes. Yeah, Joel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I told you everything. Yeah, it was. It was. They just, you know, they just turned you away. It was fine. There was. Uh, they couldn't do anything. And like he doesn't. He doesn't reveal to her what happened. And, like, well, and then like, you can. Oh, the worst part is her look because you're like, shit. She knows, and I know she knows, and this is just an awkward car ride. Yeah, and the, it, it's so interesting because like, you, you, you yes, maybe you would have. You would have gone and saved her because there is obviously a huge argument to saving her, but then to not tell her, yeah, you, you've killed basically like. <laughs> well, and then you killed like her mother figure. Yeah, 100%. like also it's just. Last of Us, one of my favorite games of all time. I, uh, I, I cry. I think, I think it is probably up there with the be- the best made game. You know, like you have like your favorites, and then. The, what you think is the best made aren't always, yeah. aren't always the same. Last of Us is definitely one of my favorite games, but I think it might be the best made game of all time. <laughs> like, That's why I'm scared about the sequel. Oh, I'm not scared at all. I'm just 100. Well, I, have, I, I, have faith. I know it's going to be good, but it's one of those things that I'm like, I don't need it. E- yes. Like, I yes. really don't need it. But I know it's going to be amazing. I know they're going to knock it out of the park because that team is incredibly talented but it's one of those things where i'm like i mean i'm gonna play it and love it but i don't need it what 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 stops me from thinking that and whether or not this is true i don't know but they keep insisting that it was always a two-parter like from Mm. the beginning they they were like when we started making the last of us one we knew that it was going to be part one and part two that's why it's not last of us two it's last of us part two so like I want to believe that was the case, and if that's the case, then yes, I need the sequel because if they if it's a story that they wanted to tell, and also yeah. the fact that Ellie's mum is going to be a character, it, it feels like this is more than just ah, what's Ellie up to now, you know? <laughs> yeah, I am interested though because I do love that barn scene with a passion. Well, I love oh, that trailer God. that they showed at the last C three. Yeah, 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 with the guy playing the instrument. <laughs> yeah, which <laughs> I mean. Great. He was, and let's just, you know, give a hand to good old Troy Baker, man. <laughs> Who doesn't love Troy Baker, right? <laughs> He's just handsome and funny and smart. He is the best. I heard him talk about, um, you know, video games on a podcast uh, once, and like he was talking about the roles that he was in, and a lot of actors and voice actors, like when you ask them about their most famous roles, they can just be kind of like, oh yeah, I remember that. Like everyone's asked him a million questions about it, but he like gets so passionate. Like, he yeah. was talking about... Right, this is how crazy he is. This is how, like, so, uh, like, in love with what he does he is. He was talking about the process that he went through to voice act a Call of Duty character and how, like, he researched it. And, and I was like, you didn't need to do that. It's Call <laughs> of Duty. Like, you just had to turn up and say, hey, frag out. I'm shooting. I'm storming yeah. in. <laughs> Like he has like... this great um him and Nolan North have a YouTube channel together. Oh yeah. <laughs> with retro replay. I love those guys. <laughs> it's hilarious. It's great. I'm sorry. We should probably go to your topic. Yeah, if you want. If if you're feeling it. <laughs> I mean if you're feeling it, I'm feeling it. Okay, awesome. Awesome. I, I didn't wanna I did, we've been uh going for a little bit shorter recently, so I thought maybe but I'm down to go. I'm down to go. I'm down to go for another topic. So I was wondering, uh John because something happened to me recently, which is the answer to my topic. Um, what is something, if you have one, what is something that you weren't enjoying, but then turned around partway through and won you back, and, and, and you did end up enjoying? So this is very interesting, because I can tell, like, there are a lot of things that I've pushed myself to finish. Yes. Where I'm like, I'm not quite sure if I enjoyed that, but I just wanted to get it done. Yes, I've been there multiple times. Where it's like, I guess I didn't hate this as much as I did, as much as I thought I would. But um, this one, my teen romantic comedy snafu. <laughs> okay. I love saying that title. <laughs> at first, title. I just yeah. At first, I was just like, okay, this is just an anime about a guy who's like all about like, oh, teen romance is stupid, and like high school romance is stupid, and all this stuff. Um, and he falls into like this kind of quasi love triangle with these two girls, and he's. It's interesting because halfway through the show, the show does something really interesting. 
Okay. Um, because in the beginning of the show, basically you have this thing where they're part of this club that like helps people. You know, they like give people, they help people. Oh, I see. Um, it's really weird. Like they make like Valentine's Day chocolates for with this one girl, and like just weird things like that. Okay. Um, but you get to a certain point where he's been giving advice to all of these you know, ancillary characters that we've been meeting um, in the school. And all of his advice is very negatively tinged. (laughs) And the way that he does things is very much by, he's like, I'm going to make myself the bad guy in this situation so that everyone rallies together. Oh, I like that. I like that type of character. That's an interesting type of character. I've seen that a couple of times. And then halfway through the show, they actually, instead of just like, oh man, you're like, you know, you're doing what needs to be. They're just like call him out on his shit. Okay. And it's a very interesting thing where like halfway through the show, it's just like all these things that you as a viewer thought were like, oh man, he's doing like a lot of great stuff. He's bringing everybody really together, you know, by sacrificing himself. Isn't that so noble? Mm. Halfway through the show, you're like, oh man, he's actually like really selfish. And like, this is actually very negative the way he's, impacting all of these relationships yeah yeah and so it's this thing where i'm how at the beginning i'm just like okay this is like your normal rom com type like sarcastic you know show whatever and like mm-hmm. comedy that's like making fun of romances whatever and then halfway through you're like oh shit no never mind this is like actually really deeply emotional and it like very much kind of turns like very emotional because it's like you need to face the fact that you constantly make yourself the bad guy because you are afraid of people getting close to you it just it gets real real at the yeah and i'm like, like oh man like i fell in love with this and of course the show doesn't finish <laughs> and i haven't gone and read the manga because i'm just like you know what i kind of am okay with the hard hard ambiguity and no you know loose all the loose ends that we get at the end yeah because i kind of don't want to know what happened I see. I see. I just want to take a quick side, um, because I love the. I this is such a relatable thing where you went, and of course the show it doesn't finish. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I've been there so many times, <laughs> and I think everyone who watches anime has, has been there at some point where you're like, "What? What? Oh, there's a manga. What?" <laughs> the worst is when it doesn't finish, and you go, "Oh, I guess I have to read the manga," and then it's like based on a Japanese game. And you're like, no! Oh, <laughs> uh, that's the thing. It's my wife. Um, uh, for her birthday, I bought her a bunch of Fruits Basket volumes. Yes. Because she'd only ever saw the anime. Ah, I see. And the anime does ends on a cliffhanger and also only covers like the first four volumes, maybe? I cannot say. I've only seen the pilot episode for Fruits Basket. I love Fruits Basket. Oh, no. Okay, well... We both love it. It's amazing. I don't know how you can not like Fruits Basket. I uh, met someone in uni in the first year of uni. She's actually a really, really cool person. But she said, hey, you like anime? And I'm like, yeah, I do like anime. And she, I was like, what's your favorite anime? She's like, Fruits Basket. You should watch it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to make a new friend. I'm going to go home with this friend who I just found out likes this anime. And I like anime, so I'm going to watch Fruits Basket. And I didn't know what the fuck was happening people were turning into wolves i feel like a fairy it is a convention. sweet show <laughs> like I okay it it's a good the shot. soma family curse they cannot hug a member of the opposite sex or they'll turn into an so animal weird. it's so weird it is so weird of a concept it's one of those shows that like you get the concept is like how can you make a show out of this and then they're like oh by the way here's deeply emotional backstory about like abuse and like it's like holy shit I, I very much have, have, have been the other side of this. So I get what you're saying, like, where you're like, hey, I love this show, but I can never, like, explain it to people who haven't seen it because the concept is so weird. You have to get through it to get to the actual yeah. good part of the show. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 I completely got us off track. Um, so, yeah, so, so what's you're... your show? <laughs> um, okay. Uh I I think that what happened to you was interesting because what happened to you was like the show almost like like lured you in and it was almost like intentional, you know? Where yeah. It's like, hey, we're going to lure them in by thinking that this is normal 
and then whoop pow it's like hit you with a real shit and it almost gives the the second half more of an impact that way oh, because yeah. you're like oh i was tricked into thinking this was just another any other old show mine is a little different <laughs> mine i'm gonna talk about um with you right now i don't know why i'm explaining this <laughs> I'm going to say words. They are going to come out of my airway into they, your ear. They will form sentences. <laughs> um, no. So I'm going to talk about this. But first, I want to explain what happened, right? So, a season came out of this show. I watched it all. It was terrible. It was awful. Yeah. Season two came out. And I watched it, right? So... <laughs> <laughs> This is I don't know why I'm explaining it like this. I just thought this would be fun. Season one of Iron Fist was one of the worst shows I've ever seen in my life. Okay? So season one of Iron Fist, I was very excited for it. I was very, very excited for it. I really like like most people, I liked Daredevil. I liked Jessica Jones. Jessica Jones was a award winning show, it was fantastic. I liked Luke Cage. Some people were split on it. Me personally, I loved Luke Cage. Season one of Luke Cage was my favorite of all the like Defenders seasons. Um, so then the last one to come up was Iron Fist. Now Iron Fist was interesting to me because I'd never read any Iron Fist. He was the he was the one Defender that I knew absolutely nothing about, other than the fact that he was a ninja. I didn't even know what his power was, even though he was the title. Um, so I was excited to dive into a character that I'd never really known at all. So I watched season one. Uh, this is when, like, the Defenders were considered, like, really good TV, you know? Like, they hadn't yeah. done any wrong, you know? Like, Luke Cage was a little bit, you know, shaky, but no one really thought Luke Cage was terrible. They just thought, yeah. you know, either they loved it They or just they... thought that the second half of the season was weaker than the first. Yeah, 100%. So then I Which is not out. a bad, <laughs> no, no, real it's negative. Not a good, uh, it's, not a, it's not a bad track record. You know, 50 is good. Um... I first came out and destroyed everyone's opinion of Netflix. <laughs> it was awful. I don't know about you. Did you enjoy it, John? Did you even watch so, it? So, I watched, no, I watched it. And Iron Fist was probably what I was talking about, one of those shows where it's like, I watched it all. I don't really think I felt any different going through it. It was one of those things where I'm just like, oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> my thing was, I don't like the main guy. No, 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 I no, hate no. Him. Um, I like the girl. Colleen Wynn? Yes. Yeah, I like her, and I think that's the only part of the show I like. And well, Rosaria Dawson, I just feel sorry for. Okay, you are making me so happy, John. You are making me so, so happy. Okay, okay. So... Rosaria Dawson, I just want to be like, can we take you away? I am you have... sorry you got stuck in this. <laughs> you, I believe, had an exact, almost the same experience as me when it came to um Iron Fist season 1. I was uh, I enjoyed the first episode uh cuz honestly I think they put a lot of effort into that first episode being kind of fun cuz he like dances and he listens to his iPod but then somehow they just completely lost all of the fun and then the rest of the season was the most boring annoying main character. Oh my god, all the side characters besides Colleen and Rosario were like B movie <laughs> Oh, oh. Really? Like all Dumbers. of these business people are just like, I'm evil. <laughs> Everyone, like I remember season one, it being an, it being like, like you know when you play a video game and you hate the gameplay but you love the story, so you're like yeah. you're like you're like wading through the gameplay. It was like that. I was wading through every scene just to get to a either Rosario Dawson or a Colleen Wynn scene. Everything yeah. else in that show was absolute dog shite. And I'm sorry for getting so aggressive. But I hated everything. But I really liked Rosario Dawson because her character had been building and building and building since Dead Devil Season 1. And she was really good. Um, Claire Temple, obviously. Um, yeah. I know we look, just call her Rosario Dawson because she's so iconic. But, um, but Colleen Wynn as well was an interesting side character who I felt was shafted so much. But when she wasn't shafted, when she was at the forefront, she was like interesting. She's yeah. like, cool. And, like, she's the fucking daughter of the dragon. Like, she's a big deal. Well, she's not a huge She's a member like... of the fucking hand. <laughs> and they treat her like she... Oh, like... Iron so... Fist has that problem where it's like, oh, he's Mr. Special, and he's the bestest, most strongest person in the world. And, and it's like, nobody, everyone, everyone else... 
everyone else is incompetent when yeah, he's around. Everyone falls in love with him for no reason. Like, why do people... Like, he's a nice guy, I will say that, but he's miserable. So, like, I feel like he would be one of my friends that is kind of like... Like, oh yeah, he's my friend, but like we don't really hang out that much. Like, if I see yeah. him in the street, I'll chat to him, and and but I I wouldn't like go to his house party. Or anything, he's that friend he's that just... I'm like, oh man, like he's gonna fly off the handle one day. I know, and like, Cause, cause I, am I feel like I want to be there for him, but he was supposed to be the Spider Man of the group. You know, he he, yeah. he in that first episode, he's dancing, he's like doing yoga in the middle of the street, and like in the Defenders sometimes he's like the chilled out one but then yeah. other times he reverts back to his miserable emo stage and i'm like and, oh my god his Matt angry Lugar. face is oh like what god. the daughter makes he's like <laughs> mm, i'm mad mm. so 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 he is he was support he was fun when he was being fun but he was always just angry or sad and it was yeah. never fun because matt murdoch is so so much more interesting and he's that you know like like matt murdoch he's is the, the serious guy he's the one who's like life is falling apart and is like really sad and angry jessica jones is the one who's like i don't give a fuck and like i'm gonna ignore my problems luke cage is the really like he's like determined and he's like i'm gonna fix everything i'm gonna have the whole weight of the world on my shoulders and i'm gonna do it with a smile and then i thought luke cage was supposed to be spider-man he was supposed to be quippy and fun but he just ended up being sorry not luke cage yeah <laughs> the I... iron fist was supposed to be fun you know but it was boring and sulky and the villain was boring and 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 and, and all these b characters right so now that I've, we've talked about this so I'm season glad, two happens i'm glad we're on the same page right so season two starts and honestly i wasn't gonna watch it john I wasn't yeah. gonna watch it. He almost ruined Defenders for me because Defenders was like supposed to be, you know, about all of them, but it ended up just being about him and Matt Murdock, and all of the scenes with him were boring and awful. Yeah. <laughs> and I like Matt. That's Murdock why I haven't Defenders. finished Defenders, honestly. <laughs> honestly, it's fun and it's good, and there's a lot of really good story bits in it. But you have to wade through the Iron Fist stuff because it's so yeah. bad. Now, 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 John. Now. I have to ask you something, because I can be vague about this, or I can go into... Detail. I don't give up. I have not finished Defenders, have not okay. finished Luke Cage, have not finished Jessica Jones. <laughs> okay, okay. I don't Here know if go. we're going to. I'm going to spoil Iron Fist Season 2. <clears throat> oh, spoiler alert. Um, If you want to watch Iron Fist Season 2, if you watch this um podcast and you don't constantly get caught off guard by spoilers... <laughs> <laughs> if you were going to watch Iron Fist Season 2, please do it. <laughs> If you're listening to this, do it so you can have the same experience that I had and I'm now going to talk about, so spoilers ahead. I am Fist Season 2 starts and I am immediately bored. <laughs> I am immediately transported right back to last year when I watched Season 1. I'm sad. I hate the main character. He's moody. I feel bad, even worse for Colleen now, because she is in a relationship with him now. And I uh, don't understand why. Because <laughs> he's obviously they get together at the end of I am Fist Season yeah. 1. But I didn't have to deal with it much. I just, you know, it, it it ended. And then in Defenders, she's kind of in a relationship with him, but she's kind of more with um the other. She's hanging out with uh, yeah, Missy. Missy and the daughters of the dragon fucking kill it. I love those two. They are the best. Anyway, sorry. I just love the daughters of the dragon. They're cool. And they almost say it in season two of Iron Fist, but then they don't. And I'm like, ah, shit. <laughs> they just say Misty and Wing. Uh, no, Night Wing and Night. So anyway, um. Getting back to my experience. So I'm starting the series. I'm like, oh, this is boring. And like, Danny loses the fist to Davos, and Davos has got a red fist. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, all right, he's got a red fist. That's cool. He's like the evil version. You know, like, there's always like the evil version of the superhero, you know? And like, so, I read up on uh, it. App apparently, I was going to say, I've got the full Iron Fist breakdown if you want it, because I actually enjoy the comic character <laughs> see that's i, I was gonna say like apparently in the comics that is a thing that happens and the davos is like he's apparently called steel serpent or something yeah it? and it's super badass like when it happens in the comic because uh he doesn't like net take it he just finds his own power which is way better than them stealing the other power that's dope now I'm at a point in the series where i'm a little bit enjoying it more right so so the stealing of the fist it was 
kind of like okay but i was more annoyed not at iron fist exactly but at the general idea that you have to have a villain that is the opposite of the ba- of the good guy yeah you know, that is such a tro- 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 <laughs> that is such a trope now in superhero stuff that i'm getting frustrated with it because i'm like none of it is ever going to be as good as reverse flash <laughs> like i'm sorry but reverse flash is the ultimate version of that you know and like I, I as many owl mans and <laughs> like zods as there are they'll never be as good as reverse flash so you just so, can't so steel serpent is is, is he's taking the first but i am enjoying that the fights seem to be more exciting in this one they seem to be a bit more so do you remember that really cool fight in season one with uh the drunken fist guy um lewis um, tan yes. uh, is the actor he was that honestly was probably my favorite fight in the show because the rest of all the choreography was really really he, awkward that is a fantastic fight he is an amazing like martial artist in his own right but like that fight was really good and i felt like maybe it was probably to do due to him like he probably directed it a little bit um so season two has a lot better fights, a lot better environmental stuff, a lot better, a lot cooler things. They also some kind of pull the the minor characters a little bit better. I don't know if you remember the character Ward, who's like his his best friend. Oh yeah, God. So he he now is is in, um, Narcotics Anonymous, which is like a bit more interesting than him just being like a crazy guy who's obsessed with his father. Like he's dealing his with drug dad. Problems. Turned into oh, fucking Frankenstein God. monster. He was like the worst oh. version of Norman Osborn ever. <laughs> yeah. Um, Joy still isn't really that interesting of a character. She's just kind of like, she's going mad. Like she's she's kind of like with Davos now. Um, not like romantically, but like they scheme in together to take the fist. Um, but they introduce Typhoid Mary, and Typhoid Mary is a good villain like she is like like actually a really good villain the problem is is that she's not the main villain davos is so oh, like, yeah. all the scenes with typhoid mary are like dude this shit is cool they found a way to do a very in- weird comic book character in a very grounded way like it's not like wow isn't she wacky she's got so many personalities she's actually got multiple personality disorder like she it's not like wow she's so wacky it's like and they address the fact that she's diagnosed they tell you when it happened and why it happened and they talk about the 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 problems and they they shoot really cool scenes where like she's um she's trying her best to so she has triggers you know a lot of different mental illnesses have triggers and and it's it's the same with multiple personality disorder so she all is, is she's trying to activate her triggers to stop herself from from switching personalities so like one of her personalities comes out when she hears rain so this personality is in control and to try and stop herself from switching she'll run the taps to simulate rain and i just thought it was quite uncomfortable but in an interesting way of like imagine gr- like holding tightly onto your personality and trying to stop other personalities coming out so much so that you're triggering yourself, you know? It's it's insane. So so that was interesting. But again, she's not a main character. So she's like in the background of the series. So, but I'm still not really enjoying myself. I'm like, this is better than season one. But better than season one still isn't good. <clears throat> yeah. Pause for dramatic effect. We get to episode eight. So by this point, I'm a little bit interested. But I'm still... My main problem with the series, and it always has been, is Danny Rand is boring. Yeah. <laughs> okay. He's a, he's a crybaby. And whiny, and not. And again, I'm not saying that you can't cry and be a superhero. There are amazing superheroes that have been through emotional shit. Just he's whiny, which is the problem. He's Spider Man three in real hard. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. In episode eight, they're talking about how they're going to have to get the, the fist off Davos, right? And the way they're going to get it back is they transfer the fist back into Danny. Obviously, he's the Iron Fist. Danny's the Iron Fist. Okay. Yeah. I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. This is the most predictable shit of all time. Yeah. Then they throw in a curveball, right? So Danny talks about how he's been... He opens up to Colleen about how he is... Um, he's been... When he had the fist... He got to the point where he was addicted to it, where he would go out, but instead of patrolling the streets and, like, fighting crime, he would go down into this, like, 
underground part of like the subway and he would just punch the wall with the fist he would just spend all night punching the wall and it would give him like this feeling of being like powerful and high and he would just become obsessed with the idea of having the fist and i at this point i'm like yeah that sounds all right because this guy sucks <laughs> so <laughs> the idea of him being addicted to the fist and being like like lustful of it even is like completely believable because i hate this guy anyway so <laughs> you know so he's talking about this and i'm like oh my goodness this guy sucks even more than i thought then john this is eight episodes in i'm still not enjoying the show yet yes yeah. and he says I can't take the fist back. Oh. And, and Colleen goes, well, someone has to have the fist. And then he says, you need to become the Iron Fist. Oh, there we go. Dude, I pushed the table away from me. I was like, no fucking way is this show going to do this. No fucking way. Sure enough, she says no. She goes, no, 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 I'm not doing that. That's not for me. All right. So I'm like, all right, cool. That was just... This show's definitely still bad. This this show's definitely still bad. They were just throwing in a fun little, ooh, wouldn't it be funny if, if, if Colleen got the fist? And that, Especially because of all that. the backlash about um, him getting being cast as Iron Fist in the first place and all. Yes. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And the fact that, like, Danny Rand is the Iron Fist and Colleen Wynn never has been in the comics, so I'd be like, yeah. there's no way that they would, they would <laughs> make... So so yeah so she she says no and then it's like Danny's miserable of course but that's not nothing new yeah so in the next episode um in the next episode um Colleen's friend throughout the series she has this new best friend called BB he's like this young kid and he's like on the streets and she's been trying to get him off the streets and and to kind of get his life together BB gets killed um by one of Davos's like servants. And then Colleen comes up and she's like, I've changed my mind. I want the fist. And dude, I freak out again. I'm like, oh my god, dude. This is there is no way they're gonna make my favorite character the main character of the show. So I'm getting excited, dude. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting excited, but I'm like, no. This is not gonna go the way I think it is. They don't have the balls in this boring ass show to actually do something interesting. <laughs> So they explain that how she has to get it. She has to perform this ceremony. She has to get a tattoo, right? Now, where does she get the tattoo? On her arm. So she now has the tattoo on her arm, just like Colleen Wynn in um, the comics. The Daughter of the Dragon. She has the big okay. tattoo up her arm. So I'm like, that's cool. They've they've made her more like, like her comic book counterpart. They've given her a tattoo on the arm. But... Now she has to take the fist from Davos. So they fight Davos. Davos is unconscious. They, she begins the ceremony and she begins to take the fist. Her eyes are glowing. His eyes are glowing. The fist is transferring. I'm up on my feet cheering. I am like so excited. Jen is like, what is going on? She's in the other room being like, why are you shouting? But I'm so excited that they're actually going to do something interesting, John. Then Davos snaps out of it and he punches the ground and with his with his red iron fist and it interrupts the ceremony of course i am distraught john jonathan i am <laughs> i'm crying i am so sad i got i trusted i actually believed this show would do something interesting for once and they fucked me over right so i'm sad i am terrible I'm, I'm davos is running off into the distance and the credits are about to roll and i am i'm I'm like, I can't believe I got excited for this boring ass show. I thought he was going to do something. Davos is running off and like, he didn't do this, but he may as well have used the iron fist just to flip me off. Yeah. His fist is glowing the whole time. Like usually in the show, the fist only glows if he's using it, but they're making a point of showing that he still has the fist because as he runs away, his fist is still glowing red. And it's like, oh, fuck, dude. And Danny is miserable again, which is just making me angrier. Yeah. But then, Jonathan Johnsick, Jonathan J. Johnsick, <laughs> Danny's like mourning and he's like, oh my god, I thought we fucking had him, but now he's escaped and he's going to wreak havoc. And then... First of all, why havoc is he going to wreak? Not to take you off subject, but like, really, what is he going to do? Sorry? What is he going to do? Like, he's going to wreak havoc. Like, what's it? Yeah. I, he's got a, he's got a, he's got a a stronger a stronger hand 
His hand is stronger than normal people. <laughs> but uh, so so anyway, that's it. So from off, so Danny's being miserable. The camera's on him. From off screen, you hear Colleen just say the words, "Danny," and then it cuts to her, and her fucking fist is glowing bright white. Ooh, dude. I'm not lying when I say I was paralytic. I was dead. I was <laughs> completely. I think I passed out for a whole five minutes. I was so excited. She gets the fist, but Davos has still got the fist. So they're like battling over it spiritually. So in the uh-huh. last episode, they storm Davos's castle. It's not a castle. It's like a warehouse. It's a Netflix oh, man, show. I was, really ho- I was really hoping he had a castle. <laughs> yeah, everything in a Netflix show takes place in a warehouse for some reason. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so they storm the castle. There's this massive fight. Danny Rand, the the main character of the show, is fighting Typhoid Mary in like a side fight that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Meanwhile, Colleen Wing is going fucking fist to fist with Davos. You better believe they do that thing where both their fists hit each other and they blow each oh, other back. Yeah. You better believe that, like, he gets the upper hand, then she gets the upper hand, then he gets the upper hand, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Danny Rand comes out to try and like save her or anything he doesn't do anything he gets blasted aside Colleen Wynn gets Davos does the ceremony takes the fist she has the fist then she breaks up with Danny (laughs) he leaves the country and then she wields her cut to like months later for some reason the show cuts to months later but this is good there's a bank robbery. All the bank robbers are running out of the uh, are running out of the um, the bank with the money, as bank robbers do. And yeah. they go to get in the getaway car, but then all of a sudden, Colleen Wynn is in the front of the car, and they're like, "She's like, you better not move." She pulls out her katana. Her fist glows white, and then the light shines up the katana and illuminates the katana. And dude. This shit was the coolest fucking... The show completely redeemed itself because it took a character that was my only favorite character, my only, like, good character that I... The only character I liked, and they kicked out the worst character from the show. Oh, my God. They seriously were just like, Danny, you're gone? (laughs) So he leaves the country for some arbitrary reason, right? For some completely arbitrary reason. He's like, oh, I gotta go find myself or whatever. And also because Colleen broke up with him. Yeah. So, this show redeemed itself so hard, and I was so excited for season three, because I was like, dude, she's the Iron Fist now. This is it. This is the show telling us that she's the Iron Fist. And that is the story of how Iron Fist became one of my favorite defenders, (laughs) one of my least favorite defenders, to one of my favorite defenders, simply by switching out who is the Iron Fist. I really hope they stick with this or at least it would be oh no i am so sorry that i got you excited john but i want you to feel the absolute the absolute horror that i felt when i (laughs) when i discovered there was another scene oh after, after the katana scene so cut two months later we're in japan we're in a bar some some ward is talking to oh yeah i forgot to say ward went with danny because also he's boring so they were like we need to ship off all we the need to send characters. all the boring fucking white dudes out <laughs> so ward is talking to some dude and the dude's getting angry and aggro and ward is like hey you'll have to deal with my friend cut to danny rand in the background and i'm like okay danny rand is here he's gonna do some kung fu they just it's the show telling us that hey danny's still gonna be in the show right this is what i think as if we we want that yeah, but I guess, you know, they they got to keep a white guy in it, apparently. They can't just, oh, God forbid it's an Asian woman leading a superhero show. <laughs> That's blasphemy. So the guy's real angry, and the guy pulls out a gun. He points it at Danny. And this is where the show goes from... It, it was the depths of hell, the depths of sorrow. It rose up to be... Th- one of my favorite defenders shows of all time in like three episodes it redeemed yeah. itself then danny rand pulls out two pistols he dual wields pistols and then both his hands and guns 
glow gold and he shoots the guns and the bullets glow and they shoot this dude so now he's got the iron fist and he's got two and he's iron fist again with no explanation well i'm sure that's what the next season's gonna uh oh, you know yeah Gosh. yeah yeah for a second, my brain went through a whole bunch of things of like, all right, what different Marvel character could he be that uses guns? I was like, we already have a Punisher show. <laughs> I looked it up. However, there I is a, an Iron Fist, Orson. Um, yeah. Orson Welles. I forget his name. <laughs> the, the movie director. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is a the character called Orson. Yeah. Who they're actually looking for him in the show, but a I assume that he is like the inspiration behind Danny's dual pistol situation. Yeah, but, in the comics, he um, basically like took a bunch of heroin <laughs> to. Um, he would do heroin to hide his chi. Okay. So that he didn't have to be the Iron Fist anymore. I see. I see. He was like the Iron Fist during like World War Two or something. No, yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe World like, War Two. I don't know. He apparently I read a little bit about him and apparently like he made a team and then eventually he does meet Danny Rand, um, and he's like friends with Danny's dad apparently I don't know but 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 my point being is that the show it came so close to making an absolute like completely balls to the wall amazing risk and, and then, then they're then like nah. scene, not only did they give him the fist back right which is like annoying in of itself because it completely takes away the significance of Colleen's choice. Like, Colleen chooses to take the fist in place of Danny to protect Danny from from his addiction and also because she is they make a point of saying again and again that she will be a better Iron Fist than Danny ever was because yeah. she is more focused, she is more trained. She's not a wimpy boy. A wimpy <laughs> but, boy. But then to not only just give him the fist back for seemingly no reason other than he's Iron Fist, but to then give him two, to even, to go, oh yeah, he's better than Colleen, by the way, because he's got two fists. Like, what the f- it just- Now, here's me going crazy. Do you think- I don't think this show is bold enough, <laughs> or interesting enough to do this, but do you think we could see Danny turn into like this MRA type dude who's just like Colleen, fuck you. I was wrong. Like just him fully like addicted to this power and to and him be the villain for the next season. Because he's with Ward. Ward's never really been a good guy. No. The, and the thing is Ward and him both have really bad addiction things. Yeah, they have addiction problems, and they both have really bad endings. Ward tries to redeem himself at the end because he finds out that he knocked this woman up, and he tries to go and be like, "I will be a father to this child." And the wom- the woman is like, "No, no, no, no! You're a terrible person. I am giving, I am keeping this child away from you." <laughs> and then he spirals, and then Danny yeah. obviously he does all this thing where he gets Colleen the fist, and then she breaks up with him because she's like, "Danny, you are just not okay." <laughs> like, yeah, so. If in season three, Danny Rand is the bad guy and Colleen has to fight him and eventually beats him, then yes, they will redeem themselves. But as it stands, this show completely ripped my heart out of my chest. <laughs> like yeah. it, it was, it was, it was, it was the opposite of therapy. <laughs> like, it was I went on that ride with you, and I want to say it hurt. <laughs> John, hello. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I, I think we lost each other for a second there. Oh, okay. You said you I went on that say, ride with me? I went on that ride with you and it hurt. Yeah, it it, it was um it was I I'm I, I it, it was just a, a weird experience. I honestly though, like I'm being dramatic, but the the bit where Colleen like gets the fist when her fist first glows, it was so exciting. It was like something I haven't experienced in a while, which was just like complete and utter like yes like this is what i wanted you know in a show yeah. because the show was so bad it was even more exciting um and even if even though i make a big deal about the fact that like it would have been way way more powerful if he wasn't the fist as well 
and she was the Iron Fist, you know, because technically when you say Iron Fist, you can still mean Danny Rand now, whereas before that scene, she was the Iron Fist, you know, yeah. which is an iron. Uh, sorry, <laughs> but um, uh, I am still uh, cautiously excited for what happens next, because I think that if the show is about her and Danny is a side character, I'm on board, because I just yeah. love her so much, and she is such more of an interesting character. Um, but yeah, that was my experience with um, Iron Fist Season 2. If you haven't watched it, I hope that I accurately betrayed <laughs> what the season was like, because honestly, I didn't miss a lot of out. I'm not, uh, I didn't miss a lot out. There was a lot of filler and a lot of garbage. So, um, garbage Garbage So yeah, John, that was um, that was this episode of Wi-Fi Friends. Have you enjoyed this episode? I had a grand old time. I think this was a good one. I think we stayed um, we stayed on topic most of the part. We had a good, funny discussion. We um, talked a, a lot about you know different video games. We got some. We didn't get super deep, which I think was good. But we still like I think got underneath the surface. Do you know what we should do? What I think we should try this out. Let's see how this goes. This before you do your fun uh, John in- outro. I want to do a next time on Wi-Fi Friends. Oh. So I think next time, I predict that next time on Wi-Fi Friends, I'm going to bring God of War to the table. Because that is something that has been impacting me a lot right now, but I just haven't finished it yet. So I don't want to talk about it until yeah. I've fully experienced it. So next time on Wi-Fi Friends, Cameron talks about God of War. Do, do you do you think you know um, anything you might talk about next episode? <laughs> <laughs> Putting you on the spot. <laughs> Um, hopefully I've gotten more into the messenger and I can talk more in detail about that. Uh, also probably, uh, cause we started some animes, uh, cause I realized I can get my wife to watch anime if we watch the dub. Ooh, the sacrifice um, that must be made. <laughs> well, so far the dub that we've been watching of orange, uh, isn't too bad, but, um, I think we might get more into that and I will probably bring that to the table next time. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> a message to go out on before John does his outro. Some dubs are pretty good. Oh yeah, I like the fairy tale dub. That's it. That's that's that's. Oh, that's uh, isn't that one uh diet one piece? <laughs> I don't. I don't know what diet one piece is. I was just thinking that it's like one piece, but not. Oh, you mean the show? <laughs> yeah. No, it's like uh, it's like yeah, it's like One Piece with Naruto. I would say every time I look at it, I'm like, you look like One Piece characters, but you're not. Uh, Fairy Tale is okay. It's a fun first season, and then it gets boring. Yeah, <laughs> that's my that's my short review. Your short... Anyway, John, <sighs> take it away. Clear eyes, full hearts, <laughs> open minds. I want to thank you all for coming along with us on this journey. You know, however, it's not about the destination. It's never been about the destination. It's always been about this journey. The lessons you learn, the people you find, the nakama you make. (laughs) So I hope you've enjoyed this journey. And you take this journey to your journey on the journey of life. Thank you. Have a great night. Star wipe. Still my favorite part. Yeah. Of every episode. <laughs> the best thing is, is that I'm just like off the top of the dome with these. But it always starts with the introduction of clear eyes. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta set a standard. All right, I'm stopping it.